You can hear them. They're ready. I know everyone's already here. It is our penultimate day of TI12. The fans are rolling in. Everyone's hoping to see the players show up today. We already had a fantastic day one at Climate Pledge yesterday on Friday. See? Look at these guys. <laughs> I thought we were supposed to be the early birds, and there is already a pretty full arena here, but Rezo, Effie, and Lacoste joining me once again for the pre-show for the morning schedule. How are you, Lacoste? I'll start with you on the end, because you had a pretty casual day yesterday. Yeah, pretty much, you know, managed to enjoy some Dota, and uh, being part of this always feels good, you know, just watching some top-tier Dota and also hearing the crowd in a long time, which uh, makes my heart pretty full. I actually got a chance to be one of the members of the crowd yesterday and watch the games from the inside. It's such a good energy and like just, you know, just feeling that uh, that vibe and like watching the games and cheering with the, with the guys. It's just such an am amazing feeling. So I'm really happy to be here as well. Have you ever actually attended a TI just as a, a viewer, not a player? No, no. Really? I was, one TI I was just watching from home, but I never like attended as a viewer. Maybe just only work or like playing. That's it. That's all you are. Work hard, play hard. What about yourself, Abby? <laughs> I know you were here pretty much all day as well, and you were excited for the final series that was yesterday. Yeah, I mean, every series yesterday had some kind of stake that we were emotionally invested in. Um, I mean, we're starting today with very high stakes too, but I just feel like the crowd hits different, you know? You can't even feel sad for your teams being eliminated or losing if everyone's just having such a good time. Yeah, there's a lot going on in the arena as well. There's the secret shop that you guys can go to. I know that tomorrow as well we have the uh, cosplay contest. That's what I was looking for. And also the late show was going on. Did you guys tune into that one? Oh, no. I I'm, I'm went <laughs> to sleep. I feel really bad for you, you know. <laughs> I was watching the games from bed, and then I see, oh, Nat, she's on the late night show. Yeah. Oh, in the morning, I'm like, ah, oh, hell no. Nah, you didn't get enough sleep, huh? <laughs> I, got, I got a good solid How was it? six Did you hours. Enjoy? The Late Show was fantastic. If, if no one tuned in, it was a lot of fun. Uh, we, I went on with Cheapstick and Pyrian and Jenkins had us do like a little friendship test to see how well we knew each other. We only got four questions because time was running short, but we got three out of four. So, That's pretty good. Yeah, and they were obscure questions that you normally wouldn't have conversations about. It was like super, what would be your superpower or something like that if you could pick anything? Was it multiple choice? No. It was free reign. We just had to, yeah, there was no multiple choice. We just got asked the question. We just had to write the same answer. So That's impressive. Yeah, it is. So we had that little graphic there as well of everything that you can expect over these next two days. Today being our penultimate day and tomorrow going to be the last day of TI. It's going to be three teams only remaining tomorrow as well, which means even though we have our top six right now, three teams are going to have to go home today, Lacoste. Yeah, it always feels sad, you know, these elimination games, you get uh, so heavily invested, you watch these teams throughout the year, and it, it kind of feels bad, it's just uh, the way it is. But we witnessed some really good Dota, we've seen, you know, LGD Gaming crowning themselves to be the best Chinese team uh, throughout the year, because they managed to play a couple of games against the Zor Ray, that was a very interesting series, you know, watching uh, Zhao Eight draft against uh, Big Draft Lanham, so that's always uh, an interesting one, and uh, I mean, every series had a little bit of uh, oomph to it. Yeah. For me, the highlight of the day was the uh, Bad Boom series against VP. The second game, especially, it was like went to 90 minutes. It was like super chaotic. You don't you don't know like for the till, till the very end who's gonna win because like the megas and people are like deaf in megas very easily. But then you know one mistake of uh, Kiritich just <laughs> going to the uh, barracks and trying to snitch that uh, you know range barrack and paying off like with their two rapiers and losing that on that spot. It was like very very exciting to see. That game was wild for sure. Um, we we all came to. The desk early, by the way, and we had like the last 40 <laughs> minutes of that game sitting here, just kind of hyping it. We're like, what's going on? What? How are they doing this? Dude, it really looked like VP had that second game at some point when they first got the Rapier on Muerta, and then they just ran for the GG push, and Wraith King was gonna d die back on, on Nightfall, but then they kept him a I don't know. They, it was the, the refresher. His, his I asked clutched him, yeah, and then he refreshed when he was a wraith. Yep. With the wraith king ulti, he refreshed and then he just respawned. I've never seen that happen before. I thought that was so freaking. Yeah, cool. neither did I. I turned it to Al and I was like, Wait, how, "How? How?" And he explained to me. I'm like, "Oh, <laughs> that, that makes more sense." But as great as the Dota has been, what's really elevated these games has been the crowd and two people who love the crowd almost as much as us is Tsunami and Slacks. 
Ah, another day of Dota. Another day at the International. That's right, Neil. We've been here all night in this beautiful fog. <laughs> I've been sleepless in Seattle, waiting for another day of Dota and more teams to be eliminated because we need to crown a champion soon. Absolutely. You know, it was Friday, good day. A lot of people, sh Jesus Christ. A lot of people showed up, you know, on a Friday to support the teams, but today is all-star matches all day, baby, and it's Saturday. Weekend Dota is real. I can't believe it. We got our upper bracket final coming later on today. We got LGD versus Spirit, a timeless classic, and we're starting things off with Liquid versus Gaiman. Ah, wonderful. Well, uh, with that news, I'm going to go back to sleep. Liquid Gaming, seen that enough? Thank you. <laughs> Good night. See you soon. <laughs> huh? Huh? <laughs> After laying in that much fog, they might actually just be dead. We, we, we <laughs> might have to check in on Slax and Tsunami in a little bit there, but their Wraith King impersonation. They, Do they, they have Refresher in the Wraith King form? Well, that's how they're still here, because I think they actually did sleep here all night. They spent the whole night here. I didn't see them back at the hotel. That is true, but I never see Slax back at the hotel. I do. That, that means oh, do no you? Good. Yeah, because he's my neighbor. I can, <laughs> you know, I can hear some random screaming going on. Oh, you don't actually Only physically see before. him. Uh, one time, I can't remember. It was 2022, one of the events, and uh, I was his neighbor. I had to change my room in the hotel <laughs> because of him. He was just—he's just way too loud. It does. It does happen sometimes when we're all in the same place. Sometimes we all share a hallway, and people are playing Dota on their laptops, and you can hear screaming at three in the morning. I've had, I've had that. Yeah, it happens a lot. It does happen a lot, but let's talk a little bit more about the Dota before we go into too much detail. We have a little bit of a video for you guys, and we're going to talk about the heroes that we think are, are broken or are co coming up in the meta at the moment. Most broken hero right now in Dota? There's a lot of broken heroes right now in Dota. That's easy. Spirit Breaker. Definitely Spirit Breaker. I think Spirit Breaker. Mmm, <laughs> Spirit Breaker. Spirit Breaker. Spirit Breaker. You just click Q. You see Dot, ooh, and you just run at the guy. And that's it. It doesn't take like one or two brain cells to play this hero. Spirit Breaker. Okay. I hate to play against him. Oh, I'm dying? Let me go click another lane and charge away. W, max move speed. Spirit Breaker or Primal Beast? Primal Beast. He picks you up through BKB and he steps on you and he breaks you and he like clobbers you and a bunch of other mechanics that just don't exist in the game, but he does them anyways. I think I already said it to my teams like many times. You guys have to play Primal. This hero is like you cannot hit them, otherwise you're gonna die. I mean, there's also Bristleback, honestly. Bristleback, I don't know. I don't know what's going on there. So, uh, how do you beat it then? How do you beat it? How do you beat Spirit Breaker? Man, you gotta like completely draft around beating the hero, ending the game, beating him in lane, having a way to catch him. Yeah, do like 30 things and he's just gotta do like one thing, Q left click. What mascot, Dota hero, best, uh, you know, represents your team? Why? I love it. Spirit Breaker seems to be the one. A lot of different reasons, though, as to why Spirit Breaker is, is broken. I kind of like Moon Meander's explanation the most, though. Yeah, you see, Dot, you click. You run at it. And then you, uh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Actually, I like how Xiao H said there is no broken hero in Dota, mm -hmm. which is kind of a little flex he's doing there. I'm he's like, I know how to beat all player. of them. I can beat every hero in Dota. But fun fact about him is Xiao H is a Spirit Breaker player. He's been playing it for many years before it was popular, before it was in, in meta a few years ago even. Mm -hmm. I remember during one of the ESL falls in 2022, he, he created Spirit Breaker mid because he had to stand in for LGD when nothing to say wasn't there, and he could only play two heroes because he's an awful player. So he's either doing mid Pinger or mid Spirit Breaker, and he kind of made it a thing back okay. then. It was very cool. Weirdly viable, and has come full circle, and we're seeing it here now. Uh, two 
here as I was surprised wasn't mentioned, and I'm going to assume because that recording wasn't yesterday, it was a little, it was a couple of days ago, is the Weaver and the Pugna low cost, especially the Pugna, because he's been rising in contest rate from groups into playoffs, and now he's at a 67% contest rate of yesterday alone. Yeah, he's just an insane hero. The, I mean, the, the reason why he wasn't so popular at the start is he got nerfed, but he also got buffed in the light, latest patch, and also some of the heroes that he was usually paired up with are not as popular, especially Storm Spirit, but this hero does everything. He's the fastest hero in Dota with 330 move speed. He can easily harass, you can't catch him, and also some of the buffs that he received. The extra 15% on that Decrypify slow. This is one of the heroes that is our like it's most difficult to trade in the lane with him all this constant chip damage he's also damaging the tower and when it gets to the mid game he has like four four saves pretty much you do have the cryptify life drain uh, defensive items like a four staff glimmer cape very difficult to catch i actually thought you were going to mention dark willow and the muerta because muerta is the hero that deals like Ton, uh, you know, a lot of time, a lot of damage, and like the Russians are dying like within a few seconds sure. to this hero. And and Dark Willow, he has like this broken mechanic of like not ever catching him and like dealing a, a lot of damage as well. So like I think those two heroes are also like worth mentioning on the on the broken side of <laughs> things. So there's a lot of things going on in Dota nowadays. Yeah, for sure, those heroes have been a nuisance, but I, I do feel that Willow and Muerta have been a nuisance since the start of the road to TI until now. Whereas Weaver, I mean that hero has seen a re-emergence all of a sudden. And it's really interesting to see how the main stage meta changes everything, but all it takes usually at TI is one team to play something, make it look good, and then everybody picks up on it. And I think that's what we're seeing with Weaver, because when you think about it, the hero's pretty good against all the strong melee offlaners, right? They can't really catch him. He scales well into the late game, and he combos very well with the popular supports in the patch, like the Willow and the Grimstroke. And it's also a flex hero. Like, we've seen some teams playing it as position four, plus also you do have a really good scaling, whether from position one or two, or position four, and also you do have a new shard, like relatively new shard that allows you to become Gyrocopter, pretty much. This newer Deso build, uh, Shikuchi, you put a mark on everybody, and this Suddenly, you're hitting multiple people in the middle of the fight, also having Satanic, and it just feels so good. I feel like some of these heroes were coming into TI, were not considered good, but as Effie mentioned, all it takes is one team to play it, and others are like, what, what the hell is this? This is a, one of the finest creations we had. <laughs> yeah, and I'm sure the, the four days, it was a little small, it was a small pool of teams that were scrimming each other too, so if one's pulling out a Weaver in the scrims, I'm sure they're like, okay, how do we deal with this? How do we make it that we could potentially pick the Weaver too? So, They've had that time to adjust for themselves, and we saw a lot of Weaver and Pugna yesterday. In fact, let's have a look back on yesterday and the gains that we were blessed with. Though, coming out from Lilith, this may buy Gunner some time to get more magnetized stacks onto Quinn. Nails him with the next rolling bogle as he tries to swash Buckle away. Locked in though by Tofu. Great spell on, and they're going to be able to catch him in the time. Ravage into the hammer. The chain stuns are real, but Gunner is somehow still alive. And he's going to in. Up with the magnetized, he's going to chase after Tofu. Tofu gets the armor shield room. What a turnaround. Shallow Grave on somebody. They're getting these heals. They get a hand of God. It's a huge amount of burst heal. Oh, straight through the portal. There's going to be the follow-up here, though. The Tusk going to fall in. Yamsen joins in on this as well, thanks to the Spectre. Now they're going to be able to chase down Tofu on top of that one. A lane of barracks before the 20-minute marker. Thorachu is going to clean up at least Yamsen, while the others limp back to the fountain, barely alive. As now will be defeated in a swift 2-0 as gaming so wide. The Boom Team! Versus Virtus Pro. There it is, Stampede run together from the torrent, and then into the Inkswell. That was well played, and exactly what VP needed. But then everybody dies on the other side. Oh man, that Wukong's command was devastating. Oh, on. The throne is there, it's exposed, but nobody is hitting it. Notice tries to get out, but God, they do so much damage with the rest of these heroes. Now kicking back in, the tombstone, double tombstone is down. The throne exposed, pure, all on top of it. Can they bring it out in time? Save. He's in the Shadow Realm and trying to end the game. The control, it's 
Hulk's gonna be there, but they find the Hex, trying to kill him. Games, they're in it! Toronto, Tokyo, and Sigim! And with that, that boom, they are going to knock out Virtus Pro in a thrilling 87-minute game. Team Spirit versus Team Liquid. That skill is dead in the water. He's making comes with the contract. He's going to be able to take out one, but that's just the Aegis. Can he take out Collapse Into as well as the Egg is continuing to go rude. out? Will get the stun off. Do they need to get Spirit? Oh. Demonic Purge onto Zai. Do they have the damage though? He's had half a that BKB already activated. Going in really deep. They pop the Egg with the Sunray as well. The Ravage is being expended as well. He's getting healed now from Insidia. This cow will live on. Vegans around the world rejoice. He lives. And now that they're trying to turn this around, Auntie Yatara by Mickey. One more charge off. Eventually, he will fall, though. So, beef enjoyers enjoy, but Jitaro will drop as well. So, there is a trade, and it's very heavy. Jitaro is using Satanic to take off Curse Crown. Not even caring about anybody. It's so much building damage. Already, both tier fours down to stacks. Sort of putting all their efforts onto the Weaver. Laura literally ignoring everybody, along with Collapse, as they will take down the Ancient and Team Spirit secure themselves top three. We're enjoying that fight in the minute if it kicks off. We're going to see okay. them try and start things. They get the drag back on to challenge with the skewer. Good damage here. They're able to cleanly take him out the first time round. It's pretty isolated. See if they can go for round two. RP straight away from nothing to say. Another skewer getting him right up into the base. Up towards the tier three. The fear <laughs> there as well. They'll be able to take him down. Jamming tries to hook up forward to help him out, but challenge has fallen. Maybe going to find him more. With a harpoon, drive by with a shield, they'll catch up one. Oh, wow. I mean, those are massive catches. This is this a gem as well, too, picked up? I think it is. Stevie's coming in. It's a split. The split is there. Shira, he's ready to dive in. They're getting aggressive on the something, something. They think the time and air fights in with the snowball. Five time for something to try and survive with the damage. He's done nothing. The same finish is on for the illusory orb. They'll go for F5. Stolen snowball here for Planet, closing in onto the tusk. F5 caught by the stun. Fire the team is coming to challenge. Hits in hard with the star break over to Shira. He's been caught by the sun. Shira is surrounded. He looks to jump out with the ultimate. Take this series 2-0, knocking Azure down. A phenomenal day one. It did see us saying goodbye to Nouns, though, and obviously Virtus Pro 2, but not before Virtus Pro were a part of the record for longest game at TI 12. So they're at least going to have a record to their name. For now, it might be beaten. And we did see Liquid falling to the lower bracket as well as Azure. So they no longer have that second lives for themselves. They're in that elimination and they're in that do or die situation for themselves, Reza. It's crazy to think that Liquid and Gaming Gladiator facing you know quarterfinals uh, of the lower bracket and you know and for elimination match instead of like playing in the finals like we used to see them right in the and during the season and uh, I do think that uh, <laughs> you've seen all the liquid fans rolling in as well right this is actually all the early birds it's just all of liquid and gaming gladiator fans yeah I mean it's it's, it's crazy I, I love the people behind us they all were cheering for the I can see the some liquid, liquid signs Woo! yeah <laughs> We, we were gauging the reaction before. I was like, Liquid fans, it was pretty loud. I asked for gaming, and it was like, maybe 80%. Okay, I thought maybe they were going to people chat. for gaming. Oh, they're on the other side. <laughs> oh, they're, yeah, they're on that side, you reckon? But anyways, like, I do think that the uh, gaming are coming to this series way more prepared because they already, like, won three series behind them, yeah. right? And uh, for Liquid, like, they're dropping from the upper bracket. So it's, like, it's not, it's not as easy to, like, um, from the you know from the losing position to like win a game, but uh, when you're like on the streak and for for gaming as well, like they have this unique way of playing when they're like pushing people, and uh, there's no other team that plays like that in this in this tournament. But on the other hand, Liquid are no stranger to the lower bracket. I mean, they have made it to so many grand finals this year, running through the lower bracket. Whereas gaming, we tended to see them succeed just through the upper bracket. When we saw them truly tested at Riyadh, they had to, they were knocked down actually by Liquid to the lower bracket and they didn't make it to the grand finals. So I, I do feel that in terms of being in this position, if there is a team that you shouldn't be concerned about in the lower bracket, it is Liquid.
We're seeing here the, the major results. Everyone that knows the story of the repeat, the three <laughs> beat between gaming caddies and liquid. A story, a tale as old as time. But before we really delve too much more uh, into this matchup, into the games that we're going to see today, we were talking about heroes, broken heroes beforehand. And we actually didn't hear from the one person I think is going to give us the most valuable information about some broken heroes, and that's Purge. Thank you, Nat. Yeah, the hero that we didn't talk about this morning was Bristleback. Uh, he's the fourth most picked hero of the tournament with a 50% win rate. But yesterday, every single game except one, he was banned in the first phase. So the game that he did get through in LGD versus Azure, they had expectations for how to beat him. And we can take a look at some of those. Before the game even began, they blocked the camps to make sure that these couldn't be stacked. That way, when later the supports come by to get these free stacks, they say, hey, there's nothing there. That should delay when Bristleback is effective as a hero. But eventually those get dewarded by FY, which is very effectively done. That was at the five minute mark. But here we are at the 10 minute mark, and we still, we already have giant stacks for him to take. Now, briefly before he clears these stacks, take a look at his net worth here. He's sitting at 4,500 net worth. By the time he clears this entire camp, he's made 1,100 gold for himself and the gold that Shadow Demon and Experience gets, uh, and Shadow Demon, the Experience and gold that he gets. So 1,100 gold catapults him to the top of the net worth chart. And this translates to this great Ag's Bloodstone build. Now, this is a big highlight from yesterday. He had already lost a team fight. He runs up against the enemy squad and his quills are doing stacking damage and he's life stealing 75% of the damage that he's doing to enemy heroes. That was 20 quill stacks on Magnus. Each additional stack was doing 1200 damage. And at the end of the game, right before they lost it with the Bristleback, despite a great performance here, Shiro ends up going for the kill. He uses his uh, Silver Edge here to break him, but unfortunately it procced on the Weaver instead. And then he utilized his ultimate here. This makes him ethereal, so he can't take physical damage. Watch how many stacks of quills he gets while he tries to kill this guy. 32 stacks. Oh, he's not done yet. More. 40, 43 stacks on Bristle before he finally kills him. Each quill would have done 2,600 damage there if he wasn't immune to damage from his ultimate. So it takes a lot to beat this hero. It is very strong, and we are definitely going to see it banned at some point today. Thank you so much, Pudge. I mean, 42 quill stacks there. Actually, I, I take it back. Maybe the audience is here for Purge and not for the teams at all. That's a big old cheer for him. Our schedule for today, we talked about it. Starting off with Liquid versus Gaming Gladiators. We might have seen this matchup a bunch of times. That's normally in the grand finals. It's going to be followed by another elimination match. It's Azure against Bet Boom. We're going to shift to the upper bracket, that Team Spirit LGD. Who, see who's going to be making it to the grand final tomorrow. And then our final series will be yet another, our third elimination match of the day between whoever wins in those two first series there. Yeah, all bangers without a doubt, but the one I'm looking forward to most is Team Spirit against LGD Gaming because these two teams have really long history together. Every single time they meet, you know that top tier Dota is guaranteed. You know that like they're going to be pushing the limits with the heroes, uh, with the drafts that they're going to come in, in the, into that series. And also, like this is a TI-10 rematch pretty much of the grand final, so... Really looking forward to that one. There's a lot of back and forth between those two teams since TI-10 as well, because we had uh, Riyadh last year between yeah. them as well, Arlington Major between them as well. So yeah, it extends. It's a pretty lengthy history. For sure. And the Arlington Major definitely had TI-10 vibes in the sense that it felt like LGD could have won it at some point. It was a 3-1, if I recall. But they were playing so dominantly in the first two games and just draft choked which was the story of them since TI-10 mm -hmm. up until now. But it seems like they fixed a lot of their stubbornness that they had in drafting. So I'm sure that Zhao Aid has a bone to pick with Spirit. Like, if there is a series that he prepared for for the entirety of this tournament, it is this one. They have a lot to prove, and I'm just excited to see it happening. But something else I also wanted to comment on is yeah. the winner of the first series of the day is going to play again during the fourth series of the day. Yeah. That is exhausting. That, that is a position that might be very difficult for either GG or Liquid. So I'm, I'm really curious to see how fatigue plays into today as well.
If you were in that position, Rizzo, would you rather be a part of the first series getting a two series break and playing the fourth, or being a part of the second series having a one series break and playing the fourth? And that's not that big of a difference, right? Oh, really? But, <laughs> but uh, I mean, usually playing f second and then the last is better because like there's a little break and uh, you can just like chill a bit, meditate, and <laughs> get your things together, and then go for the next series as well. How many of them do you think are, are meditating in that time? I don't, I don't like, I don't think a lot of players actually using that power. To be honest, like I, I only know that uh, you know Jerex, like the, the guys from the past OG were doing that. But for nowadays, like I don't know how much of the liquid are are, are doing that or like gaming. I mean, I think gaming should be doing that because like like Tofu looks like a guy who uh, <laughs> he looks pretty zen. <laughs> yeah, he, he looks pretty zen. <laughs> In the booth the and other the day, salary. he was yeah. looking pretty chill, you know, summoning uh, his inner we were strength a for a good 30 seconds. We were having a debate over whether that was meditation or if he's like, I don't like this era, I don't like this draft, what are we doing? He, he did look like he was in physical pain, but or maybe he was just really sleepy. But uh, Tofu does look like the kind of he, dude who'd eat pray love in India or something, you know? Like he'd go he went around. Find himself, bring his teachings to Dota. He could be—he's the type for sure. He's gonna ground all of Game and Gladiators. Well, we could continue this conversation, but first, let's hear more about Game and Gladiators. And we have a video piece on them that we get to watch right now. I've been playing games throughout my whole life, whether it was on Game Boy, consoles, eventual computer, like all due to my older brother and his friends that I just watched. I wanted to play, and I got into it. I was backpacking throughout Asia for a year, and I saw some poster of TI and some public viewing in the city. So I showed up there, and there's all of, I don't know, a thousand people, and I was like the only white dude walking in, so everyone was looking at me. People were like getting interested. I bought a laptop there. I started playing on a laptop. Then at some point back home in Germany, started studying. I'm like playing from the kitchen table or lying down in my bed. And eventually, when they in introduced the DPC leagues, I was like, Div 2? I can do Div 2. And then, I don't know, I eventually got ambitious and wanted to prove whether I can make it or not. He's still alive, but not for much longer. Eventually, he will fall to Tofu. I started grinding into top 100, getting into games with pro players, eventually making contacts, friends. The Golem comes down on the Sash Curtain on through, though. GG's are called, and the series will go to the Hellbear Smashers. My first team was Helper Smashers back then. Get tofu though, watch Tofu, watch Tofu. But I don't know, it's not really real if you're not playing against a real and big competition. From watching TI, it's like build off hype and emotion, and you see these teams with like fireworks winning and sad teams losing. The whole spectrum of emotions you get with like eventually people lifting the ages and me at home at the screen watching, like shredding tears, like it's so intense that you really wish to experience the same, like to be there. For me, actually making it there now is an experience that I wouldn't trade for anything else. And I'm really glad that I made it to the main stage and I hope that I get the chance to lift the ages. He didn't talk about meditation, whether Tofu is one for meditation, but he's been able to come on the main stage. He was playing yesterday, it was a very quick 2-0, and one step closer to be able to have that dream fulfilled for himself of lifting the Aegis. But I don't want to talk about Game Gladiators too much more. I kind of want to shift a little bit more onto Liquid and how we see them as a team, maybe what their mental is coming into this one, going from lower bracket and shifting, sorry, going from upper bracket and shifting into lower bracket now. They broke the curse. I mean, nobody beats Team Liquid 17 times in a row. This is what Insania tweeted. Did after they managed to beat them at three at Masters, dropping them down to lower bracket. But uh, yeah, I mean, Team Liquid, they were always like strong mentally as a team, having Blitz as a coach who does a lot of things for the team. And I'm not too worried about them. They showed that they can play some really good Dota and even under the pressure. I mean, the sad thing about Team Liquid is they could have been the best team throughout the 2023 if somehow Gaming Gladiators didn't show up as strong. I just realized we might have the inverse per se of Riyadh. So uh, Talon put Gaming Gladiators into the lower bracket. Now Liquid might knock them out, whereas Riyadh, Liquid put them into the lower bracket and Talon knocked them out. So uh, maybe there's a little bit of uh, scar tissue as well for Gaming Gladiators when it comes to this matchup. I mean, for sure, Liquid are the team that is showing up like the best when they're, you know, against uh, against the wall already. And it's like when there's a high pressure, this is when they start playing like really well. So I'm not I'm not gonna be surprised that they're gonna take this series super easy. Yeah, and I mean, we saw them last year not qualifying through DPC points, only to make it through the last chance qualifier, only to make it to third place at TI. I mean, they are no strangers to pressure. They are no strangers to this kind of environment. So I'm not worried about their mental state. I'm just worried about the matchup. Okay. itself because it feels like 
of all the teams that they could encounter in the lower bracket, Gaming Gladiators is the one that knows them in and out. But I guess the inverse can be said for Gaiman, where Liquid knows them really well. But there's also just the mental burden of having such a bad track record versus them this year. And the thing is, at one point, they were going to have to face off against each other. Whether it was this, in this round of the lower bracket, the next round, or even the grand finals, these two teams were destined with how this uh, bracket has has. Uh, played out that they were going to meet again Lacoste. Yeah, the, uh, at coming into this uh, tournament, uh, we thought that whole year was pretty much scripted because how it worked out throughout the whole year, but uh, eventually, like, this is the final boss that Team Liquid was preparing to face throughout the whole year, so now it's their time. All right, we heard the horn there. Everyone in the arena getting excited. It does mean that our day is going to start. That's right, day number two of our finals weekend here in Climate Pledge Arena. We have four best of threes, and the first one is going to begin now. It is a beacon sounding a call to greatness that echoes worldwide. A crucible, forging a single contender worthy of rising above the very best. And a celebration, gathering a community of millions to witness history unfold. It is the International, the final proving ground, where the world's finest Dota teams assemble to face each other in the ultimate test. Each challenger has earned this honor through hard-fought victories in matchups around the globe. The journey has tested some more than others, but the favorites and underdogs all know the road to the Aegis defies all prediction, and anyone can carve a new legacy here. The Aegis of Champions returns to Seattle, and with it, the eyes of the world. Six teams compete for ultimate glory. Only one can seize immortality. Who will emerge victorious? The battle begins. Absolutely. I can't wait to see any more of these games today. Oh my god. Well, you <laughs> don't have to in. wait much longer because we're going to welcome our first team to the stage. This matchup, we're going to hype it up a little bit more and we're going to try and break it down some more as well. 
I mean, this is the El Clasico of this year. It's always been Liquid versus Gaiman, Gaiman versus Liquid. It's just been, people start to think there's a script, right? There's something going on behind the scenes because how could this happen so often? But this is unprecedented at TI for both of these teams. I'm not at TI, just throughout the year in general for these teams to meet in the lower bracket. It's always one of them making an upper bracket run facing the other, but I mean, this time around, it's different. It's a different kind of pressure. They're not just fighting for the finals, they're fighting to stay in the tournament. So this means a lot for the both of them. It is an elimination uh, match. It's that lower bracket for themselves. So I'm sure there's not going to be that much experimentation happening. But I do have to ask that question of how much change up is there going to be Lacoste for a draft, for a playstyle? Because the tempo of gaming gladiators against Nouns yesterday was really high paced. They were closing out those games between the 20 to 30 minute mark, whereas most other people were taking it 50 plus minutes. Does a tempo, does something like that work against Liquid? This is their bread and butter. This is how they played throughout the whole year, pretty much. And they decided to speed it up when they. They started to play against Nine Pandas. You mentioned the Noun series as well. Uh, the key hero in that in those series was Chen. Three out of four games, they like this is how Celery made the name for himself, uh, playing it. Enchantress mostly, but these are similar type of the heroes, these lane dominators. Uh, and now he's buying auras on Chen, coming online super fast. We've seen these like healing strats coming out from gaming gladiators and uh, Team Liquid. They will need to figure it out how to match this tempo. I think the Chen is going to be banned in this series, so they're going to so they're gonna need to have final replacements for that playstyle to work, like to keep working. They need to find some maybe Dazzle, some maybe Vengeful Spirit, some other heroes to replace the Chen and keep building the source and keep having that ball, you know, that death ball that uh, Liquid and need to, you know, be stopping. Mm. I mean, you can't forget about the Enchantress too. That is a celery specialty and they can play on a tempo like that. They can also just accentuate it with these aura heroes. Reza mentioned the Vengeful Spirit is something that can carry an aura. It can also just be some, you know, pipe buyer from the offlane like Tidehunter. We did see them run that yesterday versus Nouns as well. So there are a lot of ways to play into that tempo draft. But honestly, Game Gladiators can also play into the late game. This isn't something that these teams are strangers to. If you play competitively in this patch, you are regularly playing these 60 minute games and you've gotten used to it by now. I feel like it used to be late game was this anomaly. People didn't really know how to play it because games were very rarely getting there, whether it was in scrims, whether it was officials or anything like that. But now we're seeing it more frequent. So I think teams are understanding the patience and the maneuvers that need to occur when it comes to late game. And we talked a lot about Celery, trying to ban out some of his comfort heroes. And that's tough. If, if you're trying to put that much focus on a pos 5, it begs the question of what's going to get through. And Lacoste, we already mentioned about this Pugna. Do you think it's going to be highly contested between these two teams? Uh, potentially. I mean, uh, probably there's a lot of talks coming into this series about Pugna because he really shined uh, throughout yesterday. And uh, Team Liquid, they did not play it at all. But uh, I mean, Insania did play it yesterday. That's my yeah. bad. But uh, they understand how strong the hero is. He's a lane dominator, makes uh, a lot of things very difficult. Like he's a snowball hero. And also like CY, this guy, he's cooking up some really cool drafts for gaming gladiators. And I can see why they decided to pick him up at the start of the year. Do you think CY has the answers uh, to a Pugna, Rizzo? I mean, I'm sure he does, but I, I didn't like that really big and, and wide yawn from, yawn from Blitz. From Blitz. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what's that about. <laughs> like, if Shao he, he 8 was, was up, there... He was up watching the late show, you know? Yeah, That's what it, it was. If Shao 8 was there, he would tell him to go wash his face right there. <laughs> The thing about Pugna is I feel that this hero was in the meta last year uh, during the Arlington Major to the point where he's been solved and how teams should already have an idea of how to play against it. Now, I see Pugna being very effective in this meta because you have a lot of these tanky blade mail heart buyers that go in first and outside of your spell kit and your laning being so strong, the life drain sustain is not something to be scoffed at. But a lot of the teams have already gotten used to playing these shakers mid these Earth Spirits mid, these Kunkas mid, any kind of hero that can make sure Pugna is disrupted in the back line can easily be worked into a draft. So I feel like in terms of solutions, both of these teams should already have an idea and not be very scared of it. The things to be really afraid of, I believe, are the Spear Vigor, the Bristleback, the Muerta, yeah. the, the things that have been plaguing us since the start of the road to TI. I was trying to think outside the box of, you know, <laughs> the other things that aren't always the stock standard that were being seen, but you're right, you can't overlook those ones either, and we can't overlook these stats between Liquid and Game and Gladiators. Their winning game time was pretty similar. It's very close, and I don't know if that's just now Game and Gladys having a lower average from yesterday's series, or Team Liquid's average going up because of yesterday's series. 
I mean, I think these two teams are very aggressive in the way that they play, but the difference between them is usually gaming gladiators drafts usually have like some way of uh, killing towers faster, and like th those timings are coming like way sooner. Like they, they would take the map from the liquid sooner than liquid would you know be able to take the map from from them. Okay, sorry, I thought you were going to keep going there, Reza. No. But no, you, you were right, and that's why I asked earlier whether the, the tempo that Gaming Gladiators brought would be able to match up to this one. But what do you think the conversation is in the booth right now, Lacoste, between either team? Oh, the headset's not working, apparently, so I think that's Can you lip read? <laughs> can you lip read? Um, I, I can make stuff up. It's like, yeah, the, the, the fabric is too soft, and we can... <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're definitely going to deal with their tech problems right now, but probably I, I think they're thinking about how they're going to play that tempo style you talked about, Nat, the early game aggression. So I think the carries that they're eyeballing are the Chaos Knight and the Weaver for Duraccio especially. I'm sure that Liquid know that in advance. I mean, CK has been banned out almost consistently for yesterday. We even had Aoi come in panel and say that he thinks that's the most valuable hero of this TI, is that CK. So. You're looking at the CKs and the Weavers, but now you also have to think about the Bristlebacks that have, you can't let that man slip through. And then of course there's a Spirit Breaker. There are so many heroes right now at this stage of TI that have to be solved in the first phase that you can't really solve them all. You're talking about the Chaos Knight, very valuable point. Let's actually talk about carries. Let's start with Liquid's carry, Mickey, right? He loves that Chaos Knight. You already talked about it. Why is constantly being banned out for him? And uh, this is some of the stats of what he has so far for TI this year. And he is in the top four for a lot of them, Reza. Yeah, he, he loves to take buildings. 175,000 damage. I mean, th this guy, he's uh, he's like very similar to Duracho. He's playing very aggressive. He's more of a like, uh, he takes more of a position one approach uh, more than Duracho, but uh, like still they're very similar in terms of like how active they are and like how they're finding these little pickoffs and like setting the tempo for their team. It really, it really depends which heroes he's playing because Mickey can be super explosive. He tends to join early on whenever he plays this Weaver, uh, plays uh, Spectre as well, CK. It's all about the timings. I think Team Liquid also has general, like one of the best teams in the world to understand understand how they're going to hit their timings. And I think Mickey plays a crucial part of that. And also it's just where Mickey farms on the map, right? He farms very aggressively, which is something Duraccio is no stranger to. Cause Jirachi is always pushing out waves he shouldn't be pushing out, and it works for Gaiman, but I don't feel like Liquid operate in the same way, where if Mike dies in a really dangerous place, they benefit from it. Because what comes to mind is their series versus Spirit yesterday when he was playing Spectre. Uh, it looked like that game was theirs, to be honest, but uh, Spirit had a sequence where they got a Roshan and they got a good fight, but then they found a pick on Spectre farming on their side of the map near yeah. their Twin Gate. And I just don't feel like Liquid can get away with carry deaths like that in the same way, because Gaiman have operated throughout the entire year playing, like taking advantage of space of carry deaths like that, having their win conditions be assigned to different heroes, whereas in Liquid it is Mikkei who is the win condition. Well, we're comparing uh, a little bit of stats. This is Durachi here, the Gaming Gladi. It is Carry comparing the two of them. Did anything else stick out for you there, Rezo, with those stats? I mean, he's, uh, as you can see, like Miro's talking about, he's not playing that crucial role in that team because, like, he's kind of like a playmaker for them. And the ace is, like, usually the, the carry type or, like, uh, the, like the, they have way more even split between all of the cores. Like, as for Liquid, it's, it's, it's a bit different. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah. That comparison, uh, not the stats one, but that you're talking about how valuable Mickey's deaths are and mm -hmm. sort of how okay Game and Gladiators are with Duraccio deaths, their hero pools are actually quite similar though. So they're playing similar heroes, but the way that everything else is formed around these is that key that you're talking about. But the Chaos Knight is similar between them, the Spectre, the Weaver, the Sven. What else kind of comes up there? The yeah, lifestyle. Alchemist is the big one, I, I would say, because Game okay. Gladiators, when they played against Nouns, they really did a good job camouflaging their draft, like which heroes are going to go where, because because they didn't have the, second, the last pick in that series, and also they wanted to secure the late game. You already had Dazzle, you already had this Lone Druid, which Ace is uh, very familiar playing from the offlane, so... And 23rd pick, Alchemist, they wanted to secure the late game. We talked about Tempo coming out from the Gaming Gladiators, but they also want to have something prepared if the game goes post 40 minutes, but I mean, we've seen a lot of games post 60 minutes at this DI, so they, they're no strangers to it. Mm -hmm. 
And those 60-minute games, that's where the scaling supports come in. I mean, as this TI has progressed, we've seen the importance of having supports that carry you into the late game and don't just buy utility items like the Willow and Phoenix. We'll see if any of those come out as after Roth for game one is going to happen now. Team Liquid versus Game and Gladiators. Game one. All of our tech issues sorted, the fabric fixed on Boxy's headset over there for him, Lacoste. And so now we're going to see this draft. We'll see what is going to be hotly contested between these two teams and what's going to be let through. Ancient Apparition, definitely no real surprise there. They want to build themselves up to pick a tanky hero for themselves on the side of Gaming Gladiators and Liquid love picking AA for Insania. It's very interesting what teams are gonna like, be leading through and like what do they have already prepared because like you need to understand how to beat that hero during the draft and in the game like you need to have a plan like you know Perch showed us like how do you go on the triangle how you block the camps for Bristolback for example I know for a fact that uh, Zai is uh, like if they let Bristolback ever through Zai would be the guy who's like calling you know we need to kill this Bristolback ten times so he doesn't have a game so he doesn't have that you know tankiness ability to be annoying in the game so. I'm really curious, like what is gonna, what is gonna look like in this draft. Ten seconds remaining. And the primal beast and CK taken out. I, it feels like you cannot give away primal Five beast to either of these remaining. teams, not just because of the really valuable players that play between mid and off lane, but Liquid's just, just because of what it does in terms of tempo. I mean, that is gonna be the story of this game. Both of these teams are aggressive. They don't like to sit back and farm. And the CK being the aggressive carry we talked about, like Aoi mentioned, he thinks it's the highest value carry of the patch. Can honestly see why, but when you ban this ancient operation out, uh, you're basically indicating that you want to open with either Bristle or CK. So Liquid just take it out. It makes a lot of sense here. I think Weaver is going to be the first big material for these teams oh, for because sure. they both enjoy it a lot. Muerta Weaver most definitely because both of these heroes are flexible enough, and if you're not addressing them as carries, you're putting way too much pressure just by first phasing these two heroes. Mm -hmm. And also the pairing I really like, something that we've seen yesterday quite a lot, was this Grimstroke plus Weaver, where you can't really kill the Swarm, you can't kill the Phantom, it deals ton of damage, most of these tanky offlaners are melee ones, so two range heroes against them, you're, you do have enough damage, and there's where it is straight away. And we almost exclusively saw Weaver yesterday with Grimstroke, I believe, I don't think I saw him being run without it. I think yeah, right. they usually follow up with the Grim Stroke for this fever. Maybe once, but something As interesting... Azuray had one game without it. Okay. That, that was the first one. Okay. Something interesting about that is Mew, after LGD beat Azuray, uh, he was asked about Weaver by Dove, and he said that he doesn't think that you can just pick Weaver and win the draft. He doesn't feel like CK in that sense. He says that if you're picking Weaver, you have to draft around it. It doesn't just auto-win games. Look, there we go. We talked about it. The Pogna, we talked about it in the pre-show. We talked about it just before we saw Draft as well. And Liquid is straight up going to yonk it for themselves. That's going to be their overall first pick. What I like to see paired with Pugna usually is, so this Pugna can be flexed to mid, which is something very, very cool. I mean, I know that Topsum loves to do it. He does it all the time, but Pugna just really elevates when he's paired with something like a Centaur. Oh, yeah. Centaur plus Pugna is one of the strongest lanes that we've seen this TI. And if you can pressure the safe lane to that extent, it opens up so much of the game for your team. I think the other offlane duo that can pretty much do the same thing is uh, Muerta plus Centaur. Also, the hero pairing feels really good. And also, Dawnbreaker plus Tusk. These are my favorite combinations of the offlaners at this TI because it seems unbeatable. You're playing against those lanes. It seems like you're just going to straight up lose it. It also feels like when you have uh, Pogna on the enemy team, you need to have some kind of jump to you know find him in the fight because otherwise it's going to be really tough to fight around it. And uh, the heroes are, um, I would be looking like it's like Earth Spirit, Pog, uh, maybe Ember Spirit, but Ember Spirit is not really in the meta. Yeah, even Shaker, Kanga, Pengo, all of Quinn's hero pool right now, I think it operates very well versus Pugna. True. Dark Willow was the ban though for themselves, so a little bit worried about that flex potential as well. Oh, for sure, for sure. The flex potential of Dark Willow as a carry makes it so that she can play against Muerta, right? There, there is something conceptually here where Muerta ulti is in Dark Willow just Shadow Realms, and that's a lower cooldown than Muerta's ulti. So she fares very well against Muerta as a carry, but it's also just her ability as a support to do so much damage and enable lanes that you're afraid of too. 
the how? bands are so thorough. Like every 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 single band of, the, of it, like it's, it just makes so much sense the way I'm looking at it. Like people are just so like they know each other so well that they know like for sure what they're gonna like expect. And, okay. And so, have. so you're thinking that even off the back of the brew one. The I think bed. so. I think so. Yeah. Why like is that? The, the, the brewmaster is like uh, it's it's <clears throat> one of those heroes that just up the fight and like can go on the back line and like you know find the Spagna and uh, or like find the Muerta and it's just like uh, a very strong laner as well in this current meta. And they ban Chen. We talked about this hero being super popular in the last couple of series that Gaming Gladiators did play, which leaves Enchantress in the pool. Also, you do have a dispel mechanic against the Cryptify, so you can mm -hmm. focus down those heroes. Murta doesn't have a problem with that, but other heroes might seem to have throughout the game. And also removing one of the saves from this Pugna could be crucial, so definitely looking for Enchantress inside of Gaming Gladiators. Also, the Night Stalker is a very good pickup for both teams as well. I think like uh, people are showing it way more nowadays because it's it's one of those here that like you know showing you the whole the whole fight and get get on top on top of supports very easily. I do like the small rise of Night Stalker that we had yesterday as well. Here we didn't really touch too much on, but he is there. He got picked up in two games. Two games, yeah. Two games I yesterday. think Spirit played it and uh, LGD played it. Yes, they're the two that are. Yeah, he's really good against all of these heroes that are very elusive. These uh, Pagnas, the Weavers, uh, uh, Dark Willows, Muertas. So he can get on top of them. And we also, something that Effie mentioned is these supports, they're not buying into support items anymore. They want to be scaling because the games are longer. So you're not going to see those four staffs and then Night Stalker is going to shine in those fights. Pagna, on the other side, he is that type of a hero that you know doesn't scale as much with the items, but uh, He's buying those defensive items, those glimmer caves, those four staffs, so you at least have something covered. They really thought about this second pick. I mean, maybe they were debating between the Centaur and the Sweaver. They didn't want to give uh, either away, potentially, but they just placed the higher priority on the Weaver. But, I mean, if I'm going by what I saw from Azur Ray yesterday and what Neve said, you have to draft around this Weaver. I feel like if you can take away one of its combos, if you can take away the Grim, or you can take away any kind of, you know, tanky frontliner that supports it, like a Centaur, or potentially even an Earth Spirit, then Weaver is playing from a disadvantage. I like the center for gaming now because it's it, it lanes very well against Fever. As soon as you get to Vanguard, it's, mm -hmm. you kind of like become untouchable in that lane. And you have to take it away too, right? Yeah. But I they're like also the thinking position. about it because they probably had another idea of this more time. It's either Tide Hunter or Centaur, right, on that spot. One of the reasons why I love Centaur so much is because you can protect your Muerta with the Stampede and you can also run away from Weaver relatively easy and also Stampede really good against Muerta. You run away and then you can disengage, come back into a fight when her ulti is off, so good call there. If they take the Grim here and this, I mean, so Liquid were debating the Centaur for themselves, right? But if they can take the Centaur and the Grim away from this Weaver and this Pugna, it, it just feels, it feels like the Weaver pick would be incorrect here. I think Inch is uh, more suitable for them, right? Like it's more of a celery hero and it's left in the pool and it uh, gives them these auras and like still like uh, push potential for these two heroes to shine. Yeah, I feel like if you pick the Grim, it's almost showing that the Murata probably will be pause one and that you're going to have a different pose for. It's going to be that Grim because you're right. Celery likes Enchantresses, loves Phoenixes as well for himself. Phoenix is pretty cool overall, like in this current meta. But the uh, li Liquid lineup doesn't really have that uh, that beefy beefy course. Uh, so there's like there's not, li not 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 a lot of purpose for Phoenix yet. Maybe it's gonna happen, you know, within next ne next picks. But for this time, like Weaver is uh, like one of the best heroes to actually kill the egg as well. I, I agree entirely. I think a BKB Weaver uh, just runs at the Phoenix egg and he keeps Geminate attacking. He double attacks the egg. He has the move speed to make it. So if he eggs on a certain part of the fight, he tastes his way towards it. Well, they want to speed things up on their side. A little bit of uh, extra tower damage coming out. We saw Mickey that uh, his Luna is very fearsome in that graphic. And uh, this also means that position for Weaver is coming out. So they need something in front. Like these are all relatively squishy heroes. If you get on top of them, these heroes are going to die. Mm. I, I do think flexing the Weaver to four was a good idea here because they didn't get the heroes that would have enabled it in the draft to play an explosive kind of game, right? And Luna is a traditional carry that counters the Centaurs and the Tide Hunters yep. and the Timber Saws of the offlane. She has really high damage, she out CSs them, and she provides uh, consistent damage output throughout the game where their HP isn't that much of an issue. They needed some, like, 
low cooldown catch against this centaur because X marks the spot really works well against the stampede. So that, that's a good one. I was thinking about you know maybe some off laners like Mars that could pop into the meta. Uh, these heroes are banned against you know, teams like Team Spirit, but uh, yeah, looking at two heroes from the offlane for Team Liquid, unless they want... I mean, there's, it's a still a flex pick for them, this Kanka. They can put it on the offlane, but uh, I'm mostly looking at uh, some of the beefier offlaners like Tidehunter and maybe even Dawnbreaker, just that you have that extra heal, and it's a strong lane when paired up with Weaver. Also, a cool thing about this Kunkka is that he counters the traditional uh, Quinn jump heroes that would have made Pugna's life difficult. So instead, they go for the Quinn Necrophos. I mean, having your eyes on this Kunkka may be enough to just enable this Necro pick to come out in the second phase. Oof, th this is a big one. Uh, Necro has been banned most of the time. The way they started the group stage was, uh, I believe they were playing against nine pandas or Virtus Pro, and they played Necro two times in a row. This is like, he's really good at the hero. I mean, you can still technically flex this Kunkka to the offlane, but you don't have to reveal your cards until Liquid, until the very end. When a Kunkka got flexed to the offlane yesterday versus Bad Boom, they just had their Monkey King follow it around and they countered it. But Liquid are in a position where they don't have to reveal their hand. If they don't want Kunkka to tank this matchup versus Necro, they can throw him on the offlane, but... They, they, they also need, have lots of pick. I, I think that's, that's pretty much mandatory right now because you want to have some magical damage coming up in the mid lane. Lina has been banned out. I think the other one could be Invoker because of the dispel mechanic. You can call caught people off guard during, uh, you know, one of the better heroes overall against Murta when she uses her ulti and doesn't have BKB on is this long duration tornado coming up from Invoker where you can buy like a good two, three seconds. Yeah, I'm sure Invoker is going to be banned here. I wonder if we're going to see some unique heroes like uh, Arcord or Tinker are mm -hmm. going to be pick up like for Nisha this time because it's like been historically good against Necrophos but I'm not sure if they're you know thinking about it or looking for it they already have a solid lineup though so they can pick whatever they want for Nisha that, that is uh, you know it's gonna have a good lane against Necro I want to circle back around while we're waiting for this last band to talk more about this pose for Weavix. You talked, Effie, how building it up, you need a really good combo. You need a good pairing for it, and that's how it's going to make it work as a pose one. But now as a pose four, what is his impact without one of those combos as well? Uh, that's a great question. So I think what Weaver provides to lineups that have Luna are very early rush, right? Because Luna tends to group up with her team, with her auras, and Weaver pro provides that damage reduction with the Swarm. He's also a vision hero. So when he attaches his insects to these backline heroes like Muerta and Phoenix, you can always have your eyes on them. Also, now you have the Vessel Buyer on your team that you didn't have before, which is going to be great damage versus a Centaur. So the hero can definitely do a lot, but he does suffer from the issues of not having the traditional support spells in terms of any kind of disable or any kind of save unless you buy the Aghanim Scepter, which is an out-of-meta item for Weaver, to be honest. But he does a lot in terms of damage amplification and vision. Smoker oh. is left in the pool, so probably Nisha is gonna choose, choose that one because he, he loves the hero every time he has an opportunity to have. And that's the hero I was looking for, oh my god. But I usually I usually suggest it against Weaver as a core, but against Luna it's not as, as hot, you know? Mm -hmm. But it's still like, it's, it, it pleases me to see that Dorachi is thinking about this aggressive course and like thinking of, uh, outside of the box because people are usually not looking for it. They ran a healing strat uh, yesterday when they played and look at the amount of healing that they have. This Necro, Phoenix Sunray, Bloodseeker as well. This is gonna be like, I'm, I'm seeing problems for Team Liquid. Their damage output, uh, it, it's not there. This is position five Pugna we're talking about. They might shift Pugna to a mid lane now that there is, you know, Necro in the pool, uh, that Necro has been picked. But uh, yeah, I feel like Gaming Gladiators that they got whatever they wanted in this one. This is the type of a draft that they expected to come up with and they got the good heroes. And a cool aspect of this Bloodseeker that uh, we didn't touch up on is that it's a hero that can control this Pugna, right? Now you mentioned earlier that this hero's stocks have risen up and how you control Pugna is with that backline jump. But a Bloodseeker can rupture him and silence him and just get on top of him because the rest of Gaiman's heroes don't really do that right now. And there's the Invoker that you talked about, Reza. Yeah, there's an walker. And uh, I mean, this in this lineup, gaming gladiators are not going to be able, be able to push the liquids because like there's no really mechanics to like get, go in the towers easily. So liquid is going to be the, the one team that's uh, pushing gaming gladiators this time. Okay. With uh, seeing all the lineups now, before we saw that last pick, Lacoste, you thought uh, gaming gladiators had the better lineup, but who, who has Exodia out of the two teams now? 
I would still say gaming because uh, they got uh, all the boxes covered pretty much. They have a carry that comes online super fast and uh, looking forward to see what they're going to do with the Bloodseeker. All righty, we've talked about this draft. We're going to hear some words though from the coach of Liquid. It's Blitz and Slags. Thank you so much. Yes, my friends, I am here with Blitz Dota. The crowd obviously loving you guys and uh, hoping for your best. How do you feel about that draft so far, boss? Uh, I feel pretty good. I think we got some stuff we wanted. They got some stuff they wanted. Uh, hopefully we don't lose in like 20 minutes. I hope so as well. Now, Gaming Gladiators, one of the most aggressive teams left in the tournament. They really value those laning stages. Now, what did you guys prioritize in your draft to kind of strip that power away from them? Uh, I think we tried to make sure that we had a lot of flex in our draft, so that's why, like, Zai's playing our Kunkka and stuff like that, and, you know, that's uh, ultimately what brings it all back together. Absolutely. Luna, uh, not the most successful hero at the tournament so far. Haters gonna hate, but was your team able to pick such a dynamic hero, you know, kind of shake off yesterday's losses? Yeah, uh, I noticed you're making a lot of Taylor Swift references. I'm not. Uh, no, I think... I, I honestly forgot the question because I was really just trying to catch those. Fantastic. Thank you so much, guys. Hey, we'll go over to game one to our casters. For the final time this season, we're going to have Team Liquid versus Gaming Gladiators. It has happened 12 different times this season. This is going to be lucky number 13, I suppose. And it's the first time that these two teams have faced up against each other in an elimination match that is not the finals. New territory? New Is territory. that what you're saying? I mean, personally, I've never seen this matchup before, like you were saying, so I'm really looking forward to it. I think this is a crowd favorite for sure as we get our hands back on a major final matchup that has been repeated so many times, but like you said, never for elimination in a tournament that matters as much as this one right here. It's Absolutely. really gonna be for everything. No, no other matchup between these teams really matters at this point, right? It all comes down to this. It's a question of how much have you learned over the course of the year about each other? How much can you put it to use when it counts? And how many voice lines can you spam? <laughs> As you can see from the chat, Will Line already coming out and the little bit of all chat with these TU teams know each other very, very well. They matched in every single major finals this year and they matched up against each other in Riyadh, though that was an upper bracket match where Team Liquid you know, they finally managed to get one over the uh, Game of Gladiators team. They finally got there, but can they continue that with Elimination on the line? Shaking off a loss against Team Spirit especially. I mean, that, that had to be a bit of a rough one because not only did Team Spirit, in some ways, I think, prove that they're still the better team to Team Liquid, but they also managed to do it in, like, sort of comeback fashion. Liquid probably feels like they could have won that series, you know? At the same time, Liquid looked better against them than... I mean, almost any other team has in recent history, right? I think yeah. Spirit are being humble and they're saying they haven't only played eliminated teams, but damn, they look scary. So if you compete with them, you're competing with the top three at the tournament, and that bodes well for your potential lower bracket run here, as both these teams are in the lower bracket. Still surprising me, but here we are. Upper bracket for bitches indeed, as they're going to try and prove everybody wrong and seal the deal. I like this draft. I, I think this draft's very interesting. I think both teams got a lot of what they wanted, as uh, Blitz was mentioning. I think gaming, they got their Necro counter pick, but they don't get it last year, which means Nisha has an opportunity to respond. I think they have tools to deal with the Necro with the Dispels, the Vessel from Invoker, and a lot of physical burst damage coming in later off the bug and the, we the Luna Aura going through in the nighttime. Gotta remember that. You're contesting six and eight and 10 minute power runes against gaming. You have to bring everybody to those runes. You have to be able to fight them. Luna helps you do that that pretty damn good amount compared to almost any other carry. I expect a lot of clash around the mid lane here, and I expect that habit happen fast, quick, swift, and Here strong. comes. Bounty runes out the field immediately. Liquid are going to try and battle Gaming Gladiators, but it's going to be Insania who's looking close to dying first. Tofu, he barely managed to live long enough. Holds on so Quinn can claim that coveted first blood. And even Boxy, who does have the Shikushi, yes, but they have the Bloodseeker. They see him, but they can't hit him, at least not yet. He's just going to have to suicide, though, I think. I, I don't know if you can play the lane with this little regen. The upside for Liquid, you give Quinn first blood here, but you did Don't drain move. a lot of mana off him, and... Okay, managed to dodge the dead shot, but again, still the vision from the Bloodseeker allows them to claim a second kill of the game. So not only did they get a two for one there, but they also managed to get the first blood, and they also walked away with even bounty rooms. So big win for gaming gladiators right out the gate. Nice way to start the lane, especially when you have Bloodseeker. Any of these types of trades, you set the Equilibrium up in a way where people are already missing regen or they come to lane half HP. 
Duraccio is going to be very happy about that. And this is a lane where he can just dominate, I think. Kunko's not going to pose too much of a threat on him. I mean, you're building up some attrition with, you know, Tidebringer going through, but Bloodseeker's just going to heal through all of it. So I kind of expect Gaming's laning phase to be incredibly strong here. And I think it's going to become a question of where can Liquid make the moves with their supports, gain some momentum back, and hopefully get Nisha activated. Because I think if this Invoker has a really good first 15 minutes, he can take a lot of this early game over. I mean, the Mana Burn is going to be a problem for Quinn. The Tornado is going to be a problem for the Ghost Shroud. And a Fast Vessel in this game to negate a lot of the healing could just win you some of these team fights with the back of, like, good Ghost Ship, Torn Storm in the mid game. Especially with Luna Oro coming through on all of it. It's a very strong five-man group up from Liquid if they can get it going. Yeah, Nisha starts off really strong. It's Forge and Ice already, and a lot of damage onto the Necro. If he can keep that kind of pace, then he'll prevent the Necro from being able to get that regen. But it does become harder over time. They're going to jump on his eye here, hitting their level two, while the Kunkka is still shy of that. Zai will manage to walk it off. They actually get pretty low here. Boxy is going to take advantage of this. He should be easily be able to pick up at least one kill. Celery pops the fairy fire. Zai's coming in as well. Can he hit the swing required? He turns back to Duraccio instead. A torrent to the side. It catches him. Boxy will now be able to finish him up. Yes. Duraccio can somehow keep himself alive. Just getting last hit, but no. Run down by the Shikuchi. Meanwhile, on the other side of things, Tofu picks up yet another kill. But Itania is already back into it. Shows up with the Blood Grenade. They'll have their revenge, perhaps. But Mickey make Austin his life as he's going to try and limp away. Ace, dive in the tower. Oh, it's a bad dive. Now he gets a little bit of a stun underneath the tower. What a turn around. Liquid will manage to pick up a double off that when it looked like for sure it was going to be a trade-off one for one. These are just brawls of a lane, man. And already we're seeing this aura do work bottom. Pugno with such high move speed, such good attack animation, just kiting them around. This is the type of laning setup you want versus gaming. Do not give them a head start. Do not let them run away with it like we saw yesterday. However, Quinn pushing in mid. This is an oppressive laning hero right here, and we're showing exactly how much you could do with it. Quinn is not afraid to play this hero blind. That is a scary thought. Yeah, right look, now, I mean, he's, he's, I mean, this is insane pressure right here. He has fully recovered this setup now where he was low on CS and low on regen. Managed to get a bunch of last hits all in a row, and now he is commanding this lane and will probably continue to do so. He's going to have to even TP back. He just got stuck. Remember, this is all thirst for Duraccio, which should be winning you this lane as well. So the more Quinn wins mid, the happier his carry is also going to be. That's why that kill was pretty valuable up top. Really good for Boxy's early game here. I mean, this is an interesting Weaver setup because they didn't want to play a core into the counters the gaming had, particularly the Bloodseeker. Even the Centaur can be a little bit annoying. But you put it on support. I like the idea that you have the Luna Ore to back him up in the mid game, right? A yeah. lot of bonus damage on a hero that at some point is putting out two, three attacks on everybody with Shard Sakuchi through. Sounds pretty damn good to me. That'll help him threaten those backline supports. I assume that's what we're looking at for this support Weaver, right? Get to this Phoenix or this um, Muerta and just try and force them to use their ultimates to defend themselves. Just cause chaos if you can ever kill an egg too. Yeah. I'll be really happy about that team fight. Still gaming this lane phase. It's three lanes going pretty damn well for them. It's been hard to stop this tournament. And that has been one of the biggest problems a lot of teams have faced. I'm trying to deal with the early pressure. We'll continue to get stronger and stronger here, especially as they get the first set of items. And, and I'm thinking about falls, right? That's, yes, that's that also nighttime. a very big point. We have two levels of the Lunar Blessing already, so it's one liquid that right back. Yeah, that nighttime global. And that's why I'm saying these rotations. I'd like to see the Pugman and the Weaver combine a bit on the map. Get some like ganks going, especially during this nighttime. Enable some of the cores. Either Mickey or Nisha, I think, is what you're going for. I think Zai, he's going to have a you know maybe slow game, but he's a cook. That doesn't really matter too much. But if you get these ganks going, you're really going to enable your supports. Bring some of the, the CS advantage back. Yeah. And Zai was well known for tanking a lot of terrible laning phases back when he was on uh, Secret, right? Like a lot of times they would just leave him out in some pretty rough ones. A lot of times he was playing like Dragonite, Kunkka here, very similar type of hero. I mean, yeah, it's, it's a Yapsor effect. And with that mobility, I mean, I love the fact that uh, Weaver kind of operates like a Monkey King when it comes to the mobility aspect of getting through those portals. So maybe he can link up with Insania like you were talking about. And that's one of the strengths of Support Weaver, is the rotation capability. Like, every one of his points, just at level 1, is powerful in a, in a go on situation. And the question is, I mean, if you can pressure Duraccio, you, you'd be happy to take that. You but love when you see. kill this guy and take him off the lane. I just don't know if he's going to get chipped hard enough, and it's going to be Celery making the first move to bottom. This is not what I expected out of Liquid. I expect Boxy to want to respond to this, or at least create pressure on Duraccio, try and bring him back. That's what they're doing. They're going for the kill on the Bloodseeker right now. 
Forced to TP away. Barely makes it. Meanwhile, here comes that rotation. But TP immediately coming out for the Weaver. So gaming gladiators may not be able to go for this dive as much as they want. Nice hits, though. Celery landing all of the fire spirits on and making it. And that'll finish him off. Boxy's going to try and trade out on Celery. But Ace is trying to protect his support. Staying close by until the dive is ready to go. Celery gets out. So kind of a trade. Like, would you rather in that situation be straight up dying as the, the carry and then TP back to lane instantly, or do you feel like Duraccio is not too happy about TPing out of the lane, missing so much CS? I mean, I think Duraccio is happy with that. He's not giving a, a lot of that speed as I. It's the better of the outcome, especially when the Phoenix made the first move. These are going to be in some trouble. Instantly hit with the silence, and that's enough. Lock him down with Reaper Sight underneath those ghosts. And while Zai is being run down by Duraccio as he made his way back to lane pretty quickly, thanks in part to those phase boots. This mid lane, it's just been all Quinn. I'm surprised with how well he's done in this matchup. I mean, this is a matchup where Invoker generally has done okay, or at least okay enough that he can get into the point in the mid game where your spells are really good versus Necro. But this is a wide lead to open up, and of course Gaming are going to take advantage of it with the, the quick roam, get the gang going, translate that pressure into experience for their supports. Do have that nighttime hitting full stride here, three points in the aura. So this is when Boxy's pretty strong on the map. Even Insania getting these extra right clicks in it, it does hurt when you have low armor heroes. Got him with the bugs, pulled him back in, but missed the torrent timing there from Zai. So once again, Duraccio takes some damage, but he will be able to heal up a decent amount with CS directly under the tower. You're gonna rotate your supports off the safe lane. Again, it's like you rotate three to kill Duraccio, and if you're not, you gotta create the pressure somewhere else. Seems like you're giving Celery a lot of room on the map right now. He's just lingering bottom. He's just waiting to see if Mikkei shows here again. Quid knows Still there's bounce. a ward up there, but missed it barely off that sentry placement. Now Duraccio is starting to feel the pressure. So this is where the trade-off comes through, right? You're gonna sit on the bottom lane with your supports. In theory, Duraccio is not gonna get as much. How long does Mickey want to sit down here? Do you want to bait the dive with another box rotation? Nisha can also counter gank these plays. It's the strength of Quasal X at this point in the game. Liquid should be happy to take these defensive oriented fights. Yeah, they are diving in so damn deep. In fact, they're still back there. Ace just feeling like thanks to his Vanguard and 17 magic wand charges he's built up. He's just chilling. Smart not to force it there. Liquid were pretty damn ready. You do not want to give Nisha some big turnaround kill in this game, right? Because that's going to give him the earn charges. Then suddenly he can go into the Midas or the Vessel, whichever one he opts for. Go ship used to no avail. Garacho is still just walking off the pain. He has been left to the wolves. Tough trade off. I mean, the big question here is can you accelerate your Luna across the Bloodseeker? Yeah. If you get Ancient stacks up, that's another route you can go here. If you're Liquid, just play a defensive game, get massive stacks up, put Mickey in a position where he's the number one leading net worth in the game, and we saw him carry some crazy games with Luna this tournament. Definitely not out of the question. It's a hero that can stand your ground with Butterfly Satanic timing, plus that shard in the late game. You could put Gaming in a position where suddenly they're the ones lacking the damage. Here comes another the smoke gank on Anisha. Ghostwalk goes out, but they do have detection already laid down from the sentry. He's going to try and duck away into the trees. Man, to dodge the dead shot, cuts out a tree to be able to cut a path away to freedom. They're going to have to pop the stampede to make sure they do not get caught here on their way out. Another kind of poke attempt, another attempt that Boxy instantly responds to. He's so ready to take it in these fights. I, I think he almost wishes they would dive. Like, please give me the cleanup opportunity with how hard I'm hitting right now. Yeah, again, because it's nighttime, right? Yep, and this clock will hit 10. So now gaming, they want to group up and push with a Necro and Centaur. I mean, the opportunity is going to be there. But look what, they're just holding the wall, holding it steady, farming it up. The question is, is Nisha going to go for this full vessel? Is he just going to go for a Midas and try and scale? Like, how does he feel the pace this game is going? Sai makes his first move with a boat. Should be enough damage here. A lot of heroes, but Ace also has a lot of HP, and Gaming Gladiators are coming in in force. Beautiful torrent that hits on two. Zai still chasing, but the rest of his team is backed away now that he's been hit with the rupture. Caught in place, and Quinn, he sees his opportunity to get at least one kill out of this one. Immediate Reaper Scythe put onto the Kunkka to get that stack, and they'll call it there. Good enough for them. One kill for no trade off. All right, I thought they had way more damage, but there's no like early swarm hit on the Centaur, and he just walks it off. 1600 HP in the early game, way too much without the extra spell damage from Invoker willing to make that rotation. I mean, you're not going to bring five to kill Ace, right? It's way too hard. Upside is, for Liquid, you did get this tier one top during all this mess that was happening bottom. So even if these towers go out, you're trading the map. It will open up some space for Mickey later off, you know, triangle rotation into that top lane. 
they have some room to play with here as game continues to get slowed down, which if you're liquid, you're probably happy with. You know, if gaming don't beat you in 20 minutes and all of a sudden, will they beat you if the game goes to 50, 60? It's not yeah. been their wheelhouse at this event. That's where they've struggled. Considering the pace they took yesterday, when you're talking about the Spirit Vessel versus Hand of Midas, I immediately was like, please go hand, uh, Spirit Vessel, don't go Hand of Midas, because we saw the way that got punished with Nows. Right. It's just about how you, how you feel this game's gonna go. It's an instinct. Pure instinct read. Quinn will go for the bots first on the Necro, so we've seen him do this. All I want to say almost every game here, I think it's just a map mobility thing, keep the farm up, be able to join these plays, continue to get the Reaper stacks, it just feels natural. Does make Brand him a He burns out Celery, but Phoenix operates without mana. And the siege will begin. The Pugna siege. Yeah, they already got that top tower earlier. We didn't really mention it, but now that bottom tower is going to die for Game of Gladiators. They're evening things out. But mid tower is under assault a bit from the Pugna. It cost him some time on Caraccio, who he suffered in that now, of course, because he got kicked off that top lane. You went yeah. for the trade. And this is where Mickey's going to start to pull ahead of him. So how aggressive do Gaming want to get to try and disrupt the farming pattern here? That's a big question. What is your timing that you're... Is it like Blink Dagger on the Centaur? I used to be pretty close to it. I, yeah, it just has to be, right? But the, the thing about the Centaur Blink this game is where's your what's your damage fall going to look like? Are you bringing the both supports in that smoke? It's probably going to be a bit obvious. It's hard to bring the Necro in there. And the thing is, the Necro also wants damage to come out first. So... If you get some early sustain or healing on Liquid, they have the Pugna for that reason. I can see the burst not necessarily being that easy in this type of environment. Sure. Especially given the mobility of some of the Liquid heroes. They just like stomp and then straight up egg, then you might be able to just run away from all that. Reset. That's why the calling is going to be a very vital spell for all these games. Rupture and Reaper Scythe is a deadly combo for anybody caught out like Zai is. He's going to use the boat almost immediately, see if he can get enough heals. There is going to be that boat buff to be able to help him out. They're going to pop the Supernova. They go for the Reaper Scythe kill onto the Pugna instead and leave Zai for last. And they're going to have to dive him underneath the tower. Jirachi is pretty sped up here. Mickey is trying to help him out, but the Stampede is going to run over Zai. And they finish him off and run through all of this. Deadshot going to miss from Tofu. And now Nisha starts putting some damage back onto Gaming Gladiators. With Boxy coming in from behind there's potential here but if they are fighting into the necro boats it's going to be pretty tough with all that sustain so they ought not to try and break gaming gladiators there losing two heroes not Caught a little too turn. deep but there's just no damage turnaround at this point in the game right you're still missing the vessel you don't even have the charges and mickey he's gone for the farming luna build here which you can't blame him for i mean this is standard but no eclipse that's coming out in some crazy turnaround so right now, it's gaming's opportunity to make I love this for Game Gladiators. Yeah. Keep the pace up. Straight you back. caught him out with two heroes dead. They probably keep it out the lane. And Nisha is going to be caught alone with no response. And they will quickly take that tower as a result of that pickoff. Ace dictating the pace of this game right now. He had a free lane, a free tower. And he has a very fast blink vanguard that instantly went to work. We'll take another tier one off the map with the group up. That's that Necrophos Centaur combining. That's It's going to be a problem to deal with at this point in the game. Which is way too tanky, especially with Sunray behind him. You have to fight into Morta spells, which have been problematic for a lot of teams until you get, you know, debuff immunity and BKBs or something. That's a far way down the road. Yeah. Lane mail for Zai is going to be nice in terms of running and tanking. It's also going to be pretty good versus the Rupture that has been going on him for most of this early game. It's a damn good blade mail game. That'll give you some fighting power. And Definitely once more, will, but Ike takes pole position here. Yeah, he does. Barely over the centaur. He's once again just man, he's getting so much farm out of every single one of his laning phases. It is doing so much for gaming gladiators. I feel like it's the, the biggest reason why they're able to take the pace, the super fast pace that they beat out everybody else at this Liquid. tournament with. They want to go on him. This is the tankiest hero on the map. They finally have the vessel. This is what's prompting this, and yeah, there's the damage, right? This helps by a huge amount. Suddenly, you're back on the board. You can open up some space. More charges for Nisha. It's going to propel him into the Midas. It's time for Nisha to strike back here. He, he's had a very slow early game, but it doesn't really matter on this hero if you can get some big core. Get a lot of vision. Hold. Boxy. Swarm on two. They have some magic damage to throw around. Tofu's going to have some problems with that. Yeah, he's gone. A couple Gemini will clean him up early. Medallion for Boxy. You need some extra minus armor. And as Suddenly. you get those kills, that'll turn into a Solar Crest. So the minus armor is really ramping up with this Luna damage. This 15 to 20 minute window is pretty dangerous for gaming gladiators. 
I mean, that's the big question. Yeah, is Liquid happy just going ultra late with this Luna with all the buffs they have behind him? Remember, this is going to be a Luna with a Pugna behind him, a Boat Rum, Torrent Storm around him, and potentially a Lacrity to throw on. This is one of the best Alacrity heroes in Dota because it is a ranged cleaver. It's pretty much only the Luna, the Gyro, and the Medusa, and two of those are not in the meta, so you'll take the third. But damn, does it start to hurt when those waves start bouncing around with the extra attack speed and damage here? It's a great combination to go late game with, especially with the buildup you go for now with the shards, the Satanic, the Butterfly. You just become insanely tanky if you can't get the initial burst damage out. At the same time, I feel like it is kind of a single core lineup where they've got two big percentage based damage dealers on Game of Gladiators. Tofu, he'll deal with that ward. Tornado is going to catch a mid stampede. A bit unfortunate there, but it looks like they're going to try and catch the invoke. Better stop. They got him from behind. A shows up, and Insania, there's no way he could do enough heals to outdo that damage from Game of Gladiators. They will both die. Uh, every time Liquid starts to push back, it's Ace. Coming in, shutting them down with another two-man stomp, setting up another Reaper stack for Quinn as well. He's already up to four. You cannot let Necro get to that, like, 10 territory, right? The hero just becomes an abomination of Dota yeah. with Ag's heart plus extra regen stacks. Yeah, you may have Spirit Vessel, but you don't have that much anti no. And now Daraccio starting to pick up the aggression, as we expect from him, just getting on the Liquid side of the map. Not really afraid of the jump here because what is the jump? I mean, it's gonna be X. That's it. Yeah. It's simply more of a a, a counter punch lineup, right? And I think that's mostly off the invoker. It is. So you try and jump somebody, then you get a tornado. It's a great way to be able to respond to that. Easy jump there. Rupture plus Deadshot is a nice combination. That's the thing, it's, it's mainly just been Nisha running around in ghost form trying to make something happen. But the downside with Quas Wex Invoker when you're the initiator like this is you just fall behind in farm. Yeah. And his net worth is plummeting down the chart here as all the gaming cores are picking up the pace. So you got to go back to this Midas because it's the only thing that keeps you up there. But all the time you're looking for these ganks, it does delay it even more. And now it is gaming taking the smoke to you as they want to get Quinn involved yet again with this Necro. Doesn't even have the Reaper up. Just wants to abuse the shard while Duracho is cleaning up some ancients. Feels like gaming gladiators rarely miss on their smokes, at least when it comes to these lower bracket games. They've had a clean run. Six games in a row they've won. But this one will miss as Liquid do manage to get through the portal in time. Now, Liquid did leave their ops up there. So they have pretty good wards to smoke back to in the top lane. They can switch the map up again. Dude, they are just targeting Nisha so hard. He shows up again. Insania is behind him with the heals, but it's just not enough, man. Way too much damage. And again, it means Insania because he couldn't heal up his core enough. His core dies, and so will he. And this was Liquid responding. They brought Mickey. They brought Zyde. They brought Box into this bottom lane to try and turn this. You talked about their lineup being a great defensive turnaround lineup. I mean, if you're not there, then you're just wasting even more time. Because once more Ace finds the opening, they clean it up with a Reaper kill. Stack number five, and that heart is almost completed here for Quinn. He is keeping pace with a Max or a Glaive Luna, who's had some Ancients. You've got some serious damage problems now that that pipe is introduced. With a heart completed on Quinn as well, you're, I, I think your mid-game damage is just out. You have to wait till the Luna really comes online. And this is what gaming have done to a lot of teams this tournament right now. Create a situation where your EHP just outpaces enemy damage and you drive it down a lane. And if you don't have outspam, if you don't have capability to take the fight, you run and get that trouble. heart recipe. That's a big one. I mean, you gotta feel go so it, good. Right? Oh, do you see it? Does he see it? Oh, he sees it. He's gonna go for it. Does manage to get it. So, no heart just yet for Quinn. That will buy. I'm not even sure if it buys him any time because I, I feel like gaming gladiators can still do whatever they want. I mean, it's a lot of effective net worth off the map, right? Sure. It's a big courier kill. You're buying time when this, this ball is starting to creep up for gaming. And hey, that's probably the happiest Liquid fans have been in this audience for a while. <laughs> that is you true. Get the morale back on your side every little bit counts. Having a lot more fun in the road to TI than TI itself so far. Liquid, maybe they could change that narrative though. 2,000 net worth lead for Game of Gladiators. So it's not like they're falling that far behind. It's just the fact that all three cores on Game of Gladiators are looking strong. And of course, a single fight can just open up this game for Liquid, right? If they get a good team fight where Mika gets to stand his ground with everybody behind him in the formation they want, where Gaming jump him and he survives, you turn around level two Eclipse, which is now up, and you translate that into a Roshan, all of a sudden this game looks completely different. That is always in the cards if you take a bad fight, especially with Ags on Zai. It's a pretty fast Torrent Storm for an offlane Kunkka. Spotted Boxy. 
Love the fact he's carrying his own dust. Yeah. Time lapse straight back into the silence of the blood rights. Nowhere to run in this matchup. Absolute death sentence. Look at all this deep vision that Game of Gladiators has up too. Yeah, they even have the cheeky tier two ward bottom, which you know I'm still debating whether this ward is actually supposed to do this. But hey, it's in the game. It's in the game. Why not use it? Definitely Damn one of the most value wards out there. Absolutely. Open up this tier two. Almost no defense when you have this option. You just see everything. Yeah, you get some sort of vision, some sort of support, or something sitting in the bottom part of the tower. You have that ward up on the top part. You see everybody that could TP in. It's going to be Tormentor for Liquid. It's going to try and push Mickey towards his BKB. That's going to be the big go time for Liquid. You have BKB on Mickey plus this Torrent Storm. That's your team fight. It's all coming together. If you can fight behind the Luna with the debuff immunity, you're going to be really happy in that situation because it is a lot of magical bursts coming out on gaming. Yeah. You just got to pray you can hold your ground. BKB forced from Daraccio. That is definitely a small win here. Even better if they can get the egg in time, and it looks like they've got it. No problem. Oh, Ace! It was a good attempt. If he hit Zai 2, there was a chance for the Phoenix to survive. Another X and now. Yeah, he got him. Yeah, they're going to the be able to get him off the vision from the Sun Strike. He gets him off the X, pull him back in. Oh, nice he's going to land. Mickey pushed back by the dead shot. But Ace, he's going to be left alone. Gaming Gladiators cutting their losses, and I think it's a smart play. Liquid did catch them out there, and they accept that. That was a nice attempt at the stop. If that hits Zai, you maybe get something out of that engagement, but it's very deep, especially when Jirachi had to TP out of the top off the BKB. So you know the Blood Seeker is not connecting that fight. Yeah. That's just a green light for Mickey to join it. Gets the cleanup. This will push him towards that BKB flying out right now. Yeah, he doesn't have it though. Yeah, where is it? He has pushed that tower without actually having that one. He's going to be in some serious trouble unless this Torrent can stop the Reaper side. But Quinn is way too tanky. He's not dying to this, and he does bring down Mickey. The BKB only works if you get it out of your stash and into your inventory. That is a big timing to give up right there. And another big Reaper kill to give away. Quinn's region just starting to get out of control. When he's under that Sunray with Heart plus all the stacks, it's like plus 140. Yeah. Absolutely ridiculous. I don't see you ever bringing this Necro down unless you get him in an isolated situation with the Vessel on top of everything else. And that means the front line is going to be very strong here. So he's going to take a poke at it. Oh, he's thinking about it. Once again, trying to pull heroes out of position. Game of Gladiators are not afraid of fighting under this. They have a high ground war. Yeah, he, he does. He wants anybody but Quinn right here. Yule Scepter to hold Zai in place. Quinn, Spear Vessel put onto him. They have the Torrent Storm, but he gets away thanks nice to the Shard. Fight. But they do manage to pick off that support. Toku goes down, and they back away. They check for high ground vision. It's not there. Taraccio, he's actually cutting, cut in from behind. Zai's already so low. The boat's coming in trying to help him out. But I don't think Liquid can really fight this anymore. Too many heroes from Game of Gladiators. And yeah, they're going to be losing two off this one. Godlike spree for Quinn. He, the man is just absolutely untouchable. And Duraccio, his aggression is Very off deep. potentially here as he's going into deep. Oh no, that's too much, Duraccio. They will maybe still catch Nisha. Yes, the rupture holds him in place. Maybe he feels that's worth it. Maybe he's not the real carry. After all, Gwyn is the one dictating the strength of Gaming Gladiator in these fights. A little bit of a Duraccio throw. I mean, you gotta have a little bit every game, right? It's just too far with the BKB down. Not respecting the Luna buyback. Not reading the timer there. Mickey just gets a free cleanup. Also not respecting the shard pickup of the Luna. That does add some yes. extra damage when you are in melee range of that Luna. It's dangerous. That type of fight over extension is probably what Liquid are looking for in general, right? Because their, their run-up burst is not great into the yeah. Sunray, into Necro Heal. You're going to be fighting into a calling. But if you can bait gaming into an extended fight like that afterwards, Suddenly that turnaround can be very swift, very painful, especially once the BKBs are down. So that's like gaming up to think about how far do you chase in these scenarios? Do you clump up and give Mickey a really good fight? Because it really is all coming down to this Luna, right? Yeah. yeah. And he stand his ground, output the damage, get good eclipses off. Just do everything. Sometimes these team fights can be a mess, and it's hard to decipher what what exactly is going on. I think it's clear what gaming gladiators want out of their their team fight, right? Jump in on somebody, burst them down. What does an ideal team fight look for Liquid, though? You somehow save that, or like get BKBs off and get the supports, right? You take the Mort out, you take the Phoenix out, or force an early egg and kite it. That's the situation where you can draw gaming out in a long extended fight because the supports are dead. Suddenly the Necro's not as tanky. Suddenly your go attempt with Mickey manning up isn't necessarily putting him in a position where he's stuck in the calling after his BKB goes down. It's about kiting it, right? Find the supports, kite the fight out, extend it as long as you can, and then you're in a pretty okay situation.
That's why gaming wants the burst here. They want to jump with Ace, get a Reaper kill on a big core, and set the fight up for Duraccio. Even if that hero does not die initially to Reaper, you're going to put the Bloodseeker in a position where he's thirsted so far up, he might just clean the fight up anyway. From my point of view, I feel like Tornado is like the biggest spell for Team Liquid, right? I think it's the only spell that really allows them to be able to reset off of the initiation from Gaming Gladiators. Right. Tornado, EMP, the Ice Wall, all these control spells from Isha are going to be huge. Just got to recreate that gap. Yeah, we saw that Ags on the Necrophos completed. Man, he has farmed this game. Yeah, you can't kill him. And now he's outputting crazy damage with that Aghanim Scepter over time. I mean, Quinn is, he's shown he's willing to play this hero in basically any game versus any matchup. There's a reason why. It's looked pretty damn good. 9-0. and oh. It's a big streak if Liquid can collect it as well. And I think Liquid are recognizing the fact that a top fight is coming their way. They're trying to cut creep wipes. You can see Boxy's playing in deep while Zai's using some X marks and spot shenanigans. They don't want to give up this Roshan. That's the problem, right? Like, this is a great Roshan for Liquid with Solar Crest Swarm if you can get in there. You're giving up position on it. It's going to be an egg Roshan contest now. This is pretty damn difficult because your opportunity to find supports on the back line and start on them is very limited around this pit. Celery deep in the corner. How do you get this anyway. guy out of here? What a four? Four, though. It's yeah, it's everybody. All three. That's beautiful, but immediately the BKB going off. They are doing a lot of damage. The Necrophos is getting low. Can they finish? Oh, five. Low and is just cleaning up with the glaze. And Celery dove up through the pit, but he missed the ages. He was barely outside of that range. <laughs> Gaming gladiators. They thought we are too strong to be beat right now, but that hubris cost them a massive fight. Never clump blind in the Roshan pit. If you don't expect it, you should have, because Zai just gets a three-man torrent into the boat and cleans them all up here with a torrent storm. What a read, what a move from Liquid. That is not an easy Roche contest. They just believed they had it, and hey, they did. Even gobble an Aegis at the end on Mickey. Three you can't ask for anything orange. better here, honestly. Everything lines up. You even got, like, everybody stuck in this meteor trying to run out of the pit in the direction on top of an ice wall. Nisha just cleans house. I think the funny part is there is that Quinn pops the Ghost Shroud, but then that just leaves Duraccio and Ace getting shredded by Glaives. It just bounces between the there two was, of them. There was no getting out of that the second that Torrent hits. Great timing for the Butterfly. Part of that, that'll heal up Mickey. So now we've got a little bit of sustained options here as well, but the Necrophos isn't here quite yet. Gaming Gladiators may have jumped the gun, but they do have the Supernova well positioned. Liquid have to retreat, but the Rupture is preventing Mickey from doing so, and the Necrophos is coming soon. Quinn's gonna be here. They've gotta start retreating a bit. You have a second life on Mickey, but that's it. Butterfly did get delivered though. But he's damn strong right now. Level 20 talent as well. He's gonna take down to pretty much nothing as the Coco run Rum wears off, and they have the vision of this too. They got him outside of that Thirst Vision, but Gaming Gladiators have enough of a read to know where they're generally at. Box is gonna try and run interference while Mickey goes to the escape and they get out. They had vision on that high ground. Quinn was so close to being able to get that Reaper size stun in. He didn't Death Seeker it. Oh, Maybe yeah. they couldn't get the gap close properly, you know, with Stampede and everything, but that was very close to Mickey getting caught. They're lucky to get out of there. Gotta respect this thirst and how low you get, right? Mm -hmm. That type of fight, it goes good for Liquid because they get everybody in there during the duration of the Bow Torrent Storm and the BKB for Mickey, and they just line it all up. Nisha also just got to sit there in his BKB and right-click everybody. You get in these chase situations where you're low HP. That's a very different story. Formation means a lot for Liquid right now. With an Aegis, they perhaps did not expect to have at this point in the game. Oh, this is interesting. Definitely Boxy, sure. they gave him all the farm that's coming in bottom lane. He's building a Lincolns. So they're going to try and protect their Luna. Even more buff ups. You say, you know, you've got so much to put on this Luna. You start putting some item upgrades in there like Lincolns. That's uh, that would help do a lot to protect against Quinn. He just jumps in so deep there. The Eclipse is going to be doing a lot of damage. The Meteor on top of that one with a quick full heal. Mickey aiming to finish off that tower. The Reaper Sight's going to go off. But Mickey what? on his BKB. And Quinn is getting burned out here. They couldn't even get through the ages. And over seven now, Duraccio thinks they're just diving after Mickey. But again, he has the extra life. Even if they succeeded in that, it was still a fail plan for gaming gladiators right outside of their own base. And Ace left wondering, guys, on the initiation. What the hell are we doing here? It it's just too, it's too much Ubis, right? You think you're too tanky, you think you have too much regen. But the BKB timings and the Vessels doing work here, and now they're gonna drag you back in gaming. 
Old Celery out of position. Game is crumbling for he them very fast. He comes back down the tornado into the sun strike. Pops before he can use the supernova. All it takes is Ooh. one bad torn to ruin your day here. As Zai has just turned this game around, and now all of a sudden you're facing down the barrel of Aluna with Aegis Butterfly. Grovo looking for that Satanic and taking your racks. And this is where that alacrity starts to go to work. All of a sudden, Nisha, he's a second damage source. He can make Mika even more powerful. You have to think about the Glimmer on the Reaper. You have to think about the BKP on the Reaper. Not so straightforward anymore. This is where this ball lineup strikes really hard. And the problem's gonna be is Aegis expires in a minute. Liquid can get a lot in that minute of time, but then as the Aegis expires, he picks up a Satanic. So even if that second life is gone in 50 seconds, he will have additionally a second life thanks to Satanic. You gotta wear through this. You're looking down a second lane potentially. I mean, Mika is just taking names right here, plus Sun Strikes. Oh, and a man dodge! Stops Ace entirely from getting that initiation. They're gonna keep the pressure up with the barracks being revealed. They're gonna try and burn out Mickey from a distance, but Insania can keep him healed up, even if there are no heroes to life seal off of. And they're actually just gonna be able to walk away. There is a period of time here. The Aegis expires, but Game and Gladiators don't have their full squad. Don't have any smokes either. Yeah. No punish available here for Game. That'll be two sets to Liquid. They just walk it off. Mickey, his item timing's got so damn accelerated off these last few fights. He is in prime position now, and I mean, this just felt very casual, right? You can see the bait here. I mean, Quinn is incredibly tanky with Ghost Shroud Sunray coming through. Ace is here, but you're just in an awkward position because it didn't start with you going on a court and bursting them, and you had Aegis the whole time, so even if that happens, you're going to get stuck in a awkward engagement. And at this point, I mean, Darachi is trying to clean up something that there's nothing to clean up there. And yeah, what the hell are we doing, guys? Hey, we've all been there in that moment. I think everybody in this stadium recognizes those emotions. Just a bad plan for gaming gladiators, which is, is surprising to me because I would have thought Liquid getting knocked down recently to the lower bracket. I thought they would be the ones perhaps with a little bit of main stage jitters with elimination on the line and such. Gaming gladiators been playing clean through this lower bracket, but that was very uncharacteristic slip-up from them. Game has definitely fallen out of their control. Liquid, they did an immaculate job of bringing it back. They took the right fights, they took them in the right way. That's what counts on the TI main stage. Nothing else really matters if you can't clinch those big engagements when they happen. Right now, this ball lineup is clicking on all cylinders. Just so, a question of how much more you can get, right? Because now if you get this next Roshan and you're able to push that last lane, you might just close this game out yeah. before it gets into any type of ultra late game situation. Lego to turn this game around. Let's take a listen to what their comms are like. I'm running a dangerous way, but fuck it. But fuck it. The boss of this game. You are the boss of this gym. Go, go. Wise words from a team, but fuck it. Yeah. That's an attitude to be able to take for this game because Liquid are in full control of this. I don't think Game of Gladiators can really take a straight up fight against them anymore. But we'll see whether or not that actually comes to fruition here. Nisha, he's trying to find a pickoff to make things a whole lot easier for them in the high ground push. Even forcing out Jirachio's BKB would be a big win. Jirachio holds it for now. He actually is running back into them. He Side wants to be able back, to play yeah. around this, this high ground area. And it'll be a smoke from gaming, so they're gonna take this fight. What they're looking for is a big core kill. Burst it on the jump from Ace into the Reaper, even through the saves. You gotta remember, there's a full Lincolns on Boxy. He can throw this out to block a Reaper or a Rupture. There's not much else to pop it here, and it might be something gaming are not ready for. If you don't find this Weaver, he's gonna protect the core on the front line, especially with Glimmer and the Suck coming out from Insania oh, on the back. Big wrap around, but Boxy, he ruins it! Shikuchi straight into them, breaks the smoke, and gets out. Game and Gladiators, they knew they had to get something over Liquid. And it was going to be an initiation on the back line, but Ruin. All TP now, they're gonna get caught. Close call, but everybody does get away safely. That was not a high ground you're willing to go up if you're gaming here. Especially with two other lanes pushing into your base. Somebody has to go back at some point. They will relinquish all this map control, however. Looking at a Wisdom Rune. I mean, Tofu wants it, but... Yeah, no way you're getting... Oh, really? They're gonna try for it, Sally! He's like, oh, sorry, friend, it's not there anymore. Dead shot to try and cover his retreat, but Ty has the vision, thanks to the Swarm. 
he's going to be able to catch him on the side here, the opposite side of the barrier, but maybe with some of the range damage, Sunstrike coming in, he knows he has to use the Supernova, and Liquid is more than happy with that. Really good bait by Zai, baiting out the Yules, gets the Torn after. That'll force an egg off some really small plays from Liquid. Gives him another little advantage here. Again, this is all setting up for next Roshan. There's no way you're pushing high ground without an Aegis on the Luna versus a burst-oriented lineup. And yeah, uh, Boxy gets to Ags. Changes a lot as well. Now you have the Lincoln save plus an Ag save to deal with Rupture damage, to deal with Reaper Sight damage. And how much can Ace do, right? He's on a hero that it's not like those Tidehunter games where he can just blow the fight wide open. You get one jump, you're a pipe, and that's about it. Yeah. Nisha, eyeing him up. Spotted here. This is what this Invoker, I feel like, has been so good at throughout the tournament is being in Viz, running around the map, and finding these heroes who are trying to find some... Duraccio! Oh, Duraccio, what happened? Gone in an instant, trying to help out Ace, and oh, it looks like somebody must have... Oh, screen bug. Well, at least it wasn't Duraccio. Yeah. No excuses there. Pause and look for him, but he ain't there. And... That was very fast. He is instantly gone. I feel like Duracho's read of where the Liquid Heroes are in these fights has just been a little off, right? He's just been getting in very deep into these melee range, especially versus Mika, and maybe not respecting that new Luna Shard that makes these man fights a different sort. It's a different beast. And the Liquid fans will fill out the pause with the chant as they can sense the end is nigh for this game one. Liquid in a great position, whether this pick off of the Bloodseeker does it for them and they straight up go for the high ground from here, they're likely to still catch Ace as they've got him dead rights in so many different ways. The X marks the spot, the Torrent to pull him back in. Yeah. By the way, that was double damage on mid game, so that's another oh. reason that uh, Duraccio just got shredded there. So oh, the upside is this was on top lane and not bottom, otherwise I think yeah. Garax is gone. The Liquid, that'll secure Roche for them. That was your Roche fight, right? Just gone in the blink of an eye here. They're respecting the fact that Game of Gladiators could have buyback. Better to just play for Roche, Sean. Of course, we know they actually don't, so Liquid could have ended the game right there, at least gotten Megas, but they're going to play it very disciplined. Get the have Aegis to and Cheese. Assume and... there's buybacks here. Yeah. Don't know where the gold is. And this Roche is just absolutely free. Make a full slotted pretty much. Give him an Aegis, let him go high ground and throw every buff you have on him. It's not a bad strat here at TI. Even level 20 for Zai, just gonna amp up this Torrent Storm and the, the chaos in the fight. We're talking about the control that Liquid has when it's on a straight 5 on 5 when the BKBs go down. If you don't get that burst and shorten the extension of that fight, Zai's gonna take it over. Quinn, the problem with Kunkka. He was trying to cut waves because he knows the final push is coming in, so he's hoping to be able to buy a few more seconds, but he's gonna get caught out here. He is 100% dead, but he does have buyback. So he's gonna have to use this for some desperate final hold from Gaming Gladiators. They can't afford any pickoffs. But if they could get a pick off on Boxy, that would help delay things a little bit. The Lincolns, though, is going to prevent the rupture, and he's out. Not today. Now that means rupture is on cooldown when this push comes in, and Mickey is approaching yeah, 55 it. 55 seconds. He is fully slotted out here. I mean, you're talking about this Necro has buy. What has 5,300 gold? He is buying another item. He just doesn't know what the hell he wants in this game. I mean, it's, it's got to be BKB. He's trying to get close on both. He could sell and get it here. They're going to wait for the initiation, the attempt to jump from Ace. Once again, a Manta Dodge is able to get away from that hoof stomp, and they really cannot oh, seem to Quinn do got it on Oh, he got pulled out from the tidal wave. Quinn's in trouble, but he does manage to use his shard to get out from the side. Still, though, Have buildings about are building. exposed. You can reset all you want. Your buildings are still going to be in some trouble here. Down to half health. But again, he has that Aegis. He has the Lincolns. He has Satanic to full heal him. Nothing is going to stop Mickey from claiming the Megas. You can keep going here if you're Liquid. You can reset, gain some resources as well. You have a lot of time. That'll be the BKB bought out from Quinn. Did not have it for that fight. Does that actually save him, though? Because Mickey's physical damage to the outputs is pretty intense. And part of the problem is how do you get through the saves now? Like Boxy's itemization in this game with the Lincoln's Ags is closing in. You have the Glimmer Cape. You have another Lincoln's on Nisha as well. So this is double Lincoln's that can go through against Reaper Rupture with, like we were saying, not a lot to pop it beforehand. And these are long cast animation spells. You can honestly hit them pretty reliably. 
if you're just looking only at that and not worrying about anything else here, block potential is very high. Final push will come. Once more, rally around your Luna. Let him do the work. Let the Glaives do the work. And Luna is so good at being able to siege down tier fours with those bouncing Glaives. Get pretty low already off that bit of burst. See if they can get him again. The Manta dodges. Mickey. he is so on point with it, but he does get burned out anyway. Second life. BKB and Cheese are going to be ready to go for this one. Immediately feared up, though. Does get off the BKB. Turns around, fights Duraccio. Duraccio has to get out of there. That's BKB down, though. Ace, he wants to punish it. He doesn't get the stomp, though. They what? need to That's be able to left. slow down Liquid, but Liquid actually going to turn underneath the Supernova, though. That one is going to be a little bit sticky, and Quinn jumps forward, takes his opportunity to the Reaper's side, but no! The save comes out just in time. Back to full he goes. He gets the cheese off, and now he's ready to rumble. Oh, what a time-lapse timing. Just when you think you're going to get a Reaper kill after all the BKBs and the Glimmers are down. No, Boxy is waiting for you. Turns Picks up that right Agatha Scepter against you. just in time for Yeah, that was literally just blown in. And they'll get another buyback out of gaming here. Ace, the next to pay the price. Two cores on cooldown for five minutes here. Did take your Aegis, did take your BKB. Final push is coming in. Let's take a quick listen in on Liquid, though. Uh, just I'm, I'm just dipping. I'm getting up, I'm running in. Just protect me, guys. Yeah. yeah. No, no, no. Mickey understands his strength. Chad just wants to run in, protect him at all costs. And that's what Liquid did there in that, that push. Now he has a refresher. So this is a level 25 Luna with full six slots, double BKB, double Satanic, double Manta Dodge. You can get them both. I agree. Put everything on him and let him end this game right here, right now. He's got a little bit of window where there is no Supernova, even the BKB on cooldown from Quinn. But Liquid are a bit hesitant. What are they waiting for? Waiting for the call. Waiting for the op right opportunity to present itself, perhaps. Waiting for another Tormentor. Why not? Might as well take away those resources away from gaming gladiators. And after all, they're in no position to uh, be rushing things too much. They can take their time if they need to. Now we have the EMP pull in. So not only are you dealing with the constant torn storms, the tidal wave pushing you back, but the EMP is also dragging you away out of position constantly. But to see that attempt there, though always the Death Seeker ready to go for Quinn to yeah. get out. Just start poking him down. Create a situation where you force Ace to jump, and then Mickey's gonna have a good fight. There it is. Pull him out of position. That's hit him with an all fire. See if they can get that BKB out of him, but Quinn doesn't hit the button. Hold strong for now, but they are taking damage on their tier fours. The Mega start streaming in. Nice torrent into Cataclysm. Beautiful setup, and that's going to be Ace going down with no oh flyback. And Mickey sees his opportunity now to be able to hit the tier fours. The gaming Gladiators back away. The throne is going to be that exposed. Be Garaji tries to come in, sliced and diced by the Glaives. No contest whatsoever. They can take down anybody they want on the side of gaming Gladiators. Liquid will complete the comeback in style and take it at 43 minutes. And for as strong as that Necropose looked for a lot of the game, he doesn't even get a Reaper off in that last fight. Luna just outputting way too much damage for Duraccio to deal with. Gaming, their lineup, it ran out of steam. They hit a couple roadblocks. They got three-man torrented in the pit. And that was all she wrote, right? There's just no coming back from that point because all of a sudden, the paradigm gets flipped. You're the ones who lack the damage. Your Centaur's running out of the ability to, to create the initiations to give you the burst damage. Who's setting up for who, right? You need a Necro that needs damage to come in. You need a Bloodseeker that needs damage to come in. And the Centaur can't do it for you. This Pugna is causing you a lot of problems on the back line. Boxy with the itemization between the Lincolns and the Ags providing double effective save on these cores. It's just a nightmare to play this single burst lineup into. You gotta imagine a bit of shell shock there from Gaming Gladiators. They looked the part two. They know that Roshan fight, that's gonna be haunting them for a while, but they've gotta be able to reset. Elimination, fully on the line now. Since they've been here, they've been into 2-0 through all of this one. But now, they're one game away from being knocked out of the International. And they're going to have to clear their minds. We're going to clear our minds as well as we head to the panel to break down that game one. Thank you so much, Cap SVG. Game one, absolutely 
dominant from Liquid, a strong performance for them, but it was only game one. We've had a bit of a change up on the panel as well. We brought in the big guns for this series for this showdown again. I've got Ali and Matu joining Effie and myself now. Matu, you didn't get to see Liquid win this series last night, yesterday, but at least they're one game up this time round. I mean, it feels great. Somebody was, T Gunner was already making a stat about like, Liquid win rate without like Matu on the panel and with Matu on the panel okay. like zero percent. So like, I mean this feels great. Let's go Liquid. I love to hear you still cheering on your old team there. But Owie, let's break this one down because it looked like gaming Gladiator's game to win, especially from the draft. And in the first few minutes of this game, they had that gold lead up until the first rush fight. No, I think these types of games are actually sort of the hard ones to lose because you feel like you should have taken this game and you're not too sure like where i mean they know where it went wrong but like how what led up to that were the comms weird were we feeling off you could sort of see after body language after they lost like i felt like gaming was uncharacteristically down even before the game i felt like quinn looked a little nervous and that's not usually game in standard usually they're a very good strong mental team which is why they've had such consistent success it could be tough. I mean, it's the penultimate day. This is a lot of make or break for them, and it's going to be a long day for them, even if they do win this series as well. So a lot of build up for themselves. But in that game, in that rush fight uh, specifically, Aoi, did you see what led up to why Gaiman weren't able to be successful in it? I think people are like not... I mean, I think all the pros know this, but like when you take Roshan, it's about controlling the high ground. Like, Gaming Gladiators, they sort of lost focus for a bit. They had five heroes on the low ground in the pit, and I don't know, it's just such a free fight for Liquid. They had no one scouting the pit, they had no one like prepping the fight with buyback. I'm not too sure what happened in their comms, but I think they're letting their emotions sort of get a hold of them. They're not like thinking about objectively, like, oh, we need to break the smoke, they come, they can take this fight. We need to be ready, focus. I feel like they're just playing sloppy. Like, they're, it's just bad play, you know, like, uh, Laning stage is mechanical and afterwards like th this is the first team that actual good team that they're playing on the main stage no offense to anyone but like Jeez. after getting out of the lanes you have to play like real dota and they're playing super sloppy like they're just making basic errors and giving back the game to liquid and liquid is happy to take it but there, there is something to be noted about the sloppy play because Liquid played very well. We talk about gaming Gladiator's mistakes, but I think only a team with very strong mental endurance could have come back that game. And honestly, it was the little things around the map even before that Roshan. I mean, the laning stage didn't go the way they wanted it to. The early aggression from GG looked very hard to control, but Luna was farming the entire time. Like, Luna's farm was not shut down. She was in the triangle. She was in both of her ancients. Gaming did not.